This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. Good afternoon and welcome to Juma Private Game Reserve in the Sabi Sands where we haven't had to work very hard but have tracked down a wonderful mixed herd of animals, wildebeest, impala, kudu and zebra and it is a wonderful afternoon we're very excited to be out and about and we're going to see if we can follow up on possibly the lions from this morning. Um, it's possible we might be able to find them uncertain but the other guides this afternoon are out we've got tristan as well with me we've got a uh, taylor out in pridens chad in pinda and maritz out in swalu and it is a wonderful afternoon and we do welcome you on board your live african safari everybody again welcome to the open clearings of quarantine here on the Juma private game reserve where we've got a smorgasbord of animals my name is Steve welcome on board I'm joined by Marcel on camera and I'm very excited to have you with us again as always on this very warm 34 degrees Celsius afternoon uh, we are sitting with an amazing herd here I mentioned this morning how wonderful uh, this open area of quarantine is after the rains and you would not think it is the same place. It is 93 degrees Fahrenheit indeed, those of you who work in the Fahrenheit. If you have any questions, please use the hashtag Wild Earth on Twitter uh, or at FC on YouTube. And for those kids out there, please talk to your parents about sending through an email to kidsquestions at wildearth.tv. Please don't forget everybody that you can register on the website wild earth website and head over to the live safari page where you can also submit questions there i hope you have a wonderful afternoon with us it's started off beautifully here with all of these animals and uh, it's my first baby in parlors because i missed the breeding season and in amongst this herd of wildebeest is a baby 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 wildebeest that we can't see now but it's very very special times of year those of you who like baby animals and green vegetation and flowers, this is the time of year to join us on safari in the wild. But if it's a bit too hot for you, well, then staying at home in your cool armchair, in your living room, wherever you might be, might be a better bet. It is very warm. It is a very melty kind of weather. Ice doesn't last very long if you can get your hands on it. Nice little mixed herds here. Animals obviously keeping vigilance in their many numbers. It's easy to relax when there's many eyes and ears. And this open air of quarantine that gets utilized extensively by these animals throughout the year booms back after the rain and enormous amounts of wild flowers and forbs are occurring here on these open areas. Oh, here he comes, directly in front of Marcello at 12 o'clock. We can just see some ears flapping. Can you see him? Just behind the bottom of this elephant to the right. Oh, there he goes, an elephant. Hello, big fella. He wants to come join the party as well. Now, many a time in the past, in open areas like this that have frequent use of animals, you'll often find Big accumulations, mixed species herds, rhino, elephant, wildebeest, zebra and impala as we can see now because these areas are hugely sort of dominant in wildflowers and small forbs giving the grazes, the grasses that come through and the mixed feeders and browsers all of the really nice sort of herbaceous vegetation often quite high in nitrogen and different types of, of plant proteins. There's actually two elephants there. One on the left, one on the right. wonder if they've already been down to the watering hole. The flapping of the ears indicates very warm. 
and come and join us. I wonder if we can recognise any of them. It's a wonderful time with some elephants before going on leave. Oh, there's a whole herd coming up now. Okay, that's splendid. Tristan on his way through said there was one big bull on the way. But now it actually looks like an entire herd is on the way. Oh, Peter, it is always splendid to spend time with herds like this. I mean, we just popped out we 30 seconds from camp and um, we thought, well, this is a great place to start. Don't have to go very far. We could basically see this from the veranda. And that's why many lodges, many of the guests, something that I've always encouraged in the past with guests when you do go on safaris is sometimes just stay you know, in for an afternoon or for a morning. Don't always have to go out and about on safari. You do see lots out there, but it's amazing what comes towards your camp in the mornings. Why oh, little baby zebra. To come and have a drink and to feed. And I've had guests that have had mind-blowing encounters, just sitting, watching, drinking a coffee from the safety of the deck and all the animals that come and visit. A very special, special place. From the comfort of your pool, I suppose, if you've got a pool on your large deck, which some people do. Mm. How nice is a pool sound right now, Marcello? Well, we're probably going to stay here with this herd and herd and herd. It's accumulation of animals while we send you over to and beyond Pinda to say good afternoon. Welcome everybody to and beyond Pinda private game reserve. Look what we've come across. A mother and calf, white rhino. My name's Chad, behind camera we have Glenn, there's Glenn, and we've come out into the beautiful western parts of and beyond Pinda Private Game Reserve, into the beautiful vast grasslands, and we've come across this female rhino with her calf. You can see the calf's actually looking away from us at the moment. As we pulled up, the, the calf was turned straight towards us, um, looking at us. It is very, very windy this afternoon. There's quite a lot of uh, cloud cover around. It was an extremely hot day um, in the morning, but it seemed like the weather's turning a little bit. Um, but we've come out into this beautiful open area to look for some of the bigger grazer animals, such as these white rhinos, maybe some buffaloes. There's a few elephants that often hang around in this area. And if you, if you have a look at the, these rhinos, the, the youngster in, uh, especially, you can see that the youngster's got his head up, looking around. I mean, you can see those ears moving side to side, constantly looking around. With this wind, these rhinos are going to feel a little bit vulnerable. Um, they often use their, their sense of hearing as well as smell um, to detect any potential threats. Um, in the area and you can imagine with this wind it's very hard to be able to detect any predators especially by smell and hearing and you can see that youngster just moving around a little bit you can see mom on the left there is a, a little bit more relaxed it seems like she was actually might have been in a wallow a little bit earlier on you can see there's two shades of color um, a little bit darker on the bottom and then lighter on the top and in these little drainage lines in these valleys, there's often a, a little bit of a mud wallow, some water around, and in the heat of the day, she might have been laying in there just to cool off a little bit. Also, with these rhinos moving through these beautiful grasslands, you can imagine there's also lots and lots of ticks around. So when she soaks herself in uh, mud, she can often then dry, that mud can dry, and it can potentially then take off those ticks. What she'll do is maybe go up to a, a big stump and rub herself up against that stump to try and remove the, the ticks. But I mean, you can see now, mom's relaxed a little bit. She's got her head down, feeding. I mean, you can see she's moving slowly. The youngster is a, a little bit nervous still, 
But we're going to spend a little bit of time here with these two white rhinos, see what they get up to. I'm going to send you over to Twalu. Good afternoon, guys. It is a beautiful, warm afternoon here at Tualu Kalahari. Um, luckily, there's a little bit of a breeze going, so it's not too warm, unless you're sitting in the sun like we are. Um, but yeah, we came back to these cheetahs to this afternoon to see if they are going to do something. At the moment, not much. By the way, guys, my name is Moritz. Behind the camera, we've got Craig. And so, yeah, came back to the cheetahs. They are a little bit relaxed still. On our way here, we did see some springbok on the clearing. There's some blue wildebeest as well. The blue wildebeest, one blue wildebeest male knows about them though. So he's alarm calling the whole time. I think he smelt them first because the wind is unfortunately blowing in that direction where the springbok and so on are as well. However, as they are lying towards the direction of their bellies, so towards us, um, is another clearing on the other side of the waterhole, which the way the wind is blowing, is going to be perfect for them to hunt in later on this afternoon so we'll we're hopeful that they might do something um as we've mentioned this morning and as you can see right now as well they are quite hungry um so i'm pretty sure they're going to look to hunt but we'll have to see you know in the bush things don't always happen as you wanted to or as they wanted to sometimes um so yeah guys um we're going to spend some time with them see if they do something. I don't think it's going to happen right now, but luckily, you know, that's always the positive about being here. While it's still warm, you get to them while they're still inactive, and then you can wake up with them and start the hunt with them and so on. But in the meantime, while we wait here, we're going to send you over to Steve with his elephants and see what happens there. Welcome back, everybody. Well, we are now surrounded by elephants, not complaining, it's a very special place to be. Got a cheeky little bull on my right hand side. See how he interacts with the herd now. There's some quite small little youngsters in there. He knows them though. There's no big animosity being shared between them at the moment. They clearly know him. How special is this? It's just animals everywhere. We've got tons of animals here, everybody, and I mean that quite literally. Tons. Maybe hear the little whistles of the European bee eaters around. Flying in the sky. Here's a cheeky little youngster that's completely saturated from swimming. Did you have a swim, little fellow? Yes, I did. Look how dark I am. So now, if you ever have any doubt with regards to the behavior of a herd of elephants, the indication here, yeah, they're coming back here, the indication that these youngsters are on their own is a very good indication that they're very relaxed towards us. Whatever's going on with them right now is possibly to do with that bull being a little bit too sort of feisty or maybe he's a bit interested. Sorry about the back of the vehicle. Animals have decided to go behind us. Let me reposition my cello. <laughs> Elephants are just chasing everybody. What are you doing? What are you doing, fellas? What are you doing? <laughs> Chasing the wildebeest. Look at him. He's going again. Here we go. Something's going on with them. I don't know what. They're all over the place. It's almost as if they might have picked up the residual smell of something. But they've already been to a watering hole, maybe. They feel like going to Gallego now, but it's almost as if they're going from marula tree to marula tree looking for the ripeness. That one there has definitely got a lot of, well, a lot of marulas on the floor. And that's exactly what they've been doing. They've been trying to find exactly which ones 
by providing them with the, the delicious fruit. Like a candy store, and that bull's getting a bit possessive about it. He's saying, it's my fruit, my marula tree. It's almost like he tried to run there before any of them could get there. And they're all like, sorry, sir, but food is for all of us. It's for the common good. Oh, so splendid to see all the bears crossing our path. And if they all do continue to cross, we'll see. Here he comes, Marcelo. Can you see him? This is the little one we saw. I don't know if you've all seen any of the young wildebeest yet, but this is the first one for me. They're normally born in December. And this one's tiny. He's brand new. Normally there should be a few already with the herd. I don't see any more. And none of the females look loaded the little mini me it's all happening now sometimes you don't have to go very far to find the action you can still see the little umbilical cord on this little youngster as it sticks very close to its mother. Alrighty guys, so you are still with the cheetahs. They're not doing much. The wind is picking up actually, which is great. I was telling Craig now the conditions are actually perfect for them to be hunting in. However, it, the sun is still a little warm, so I hope that they'll get active soon. We've now seeked some shade of our own just to be out of the direct sun, and I have to say it does help quite a bit. Um, but yeah, now it's just a patience game. Like I mentioned earlier, there's some springbok not too far away from here. The wind is at, at the moment not great for the cheetahs. However, they can maneuver around it if they need to. But with cheetahs, typically you do find them utilizing the wind quite a, quite a lot when they are hunting. So they'll most likely, when they get up, um, start walking more towards us, you know, towards the waterhole and then see what's on the clearing behind the waterhole instead of going the direction that the wind is blowing and giving their posi position away or their presence away immediately. So we'll have to see what the situation is you can still see them popping up their heads every now and again you know keeping an eye out for something that moves into the uh close you know close proximity to them or into the vicinity um so hopefully we'll get lucky this afternoon and be able to witness a hunt uh, these boys are quite successful hunters so uh, the fact that they haven't eaten anything in the last two days which we know of um, is making the chances all the more better for us to see at least a chase. So that'll be great. Hopefully they'll be successful. It's not often that you get to see cheetahs hunting, so that's always a special sighting to have. So we'll have to have a look. But yeah, guys, I think we're going to stick for them for a little bit longer and see what they get up to. Welcome back everybody to and beyond Pinda. We've come a little bit further up onto the ridge line uh, from where those white rhinos were and we've come across this beautiful herd of wildebeest, some zebra, some impalas and far off in the distance I can even see some giraffe. But it's, it's quite interesting, I was watching this male wildebeest in front of us and you can see that little stick in front of him he was actually rubbing his head up against the the branch and wildebeest they have a, a sense organ uh, on their face called the preorbital gland and what that is is this is a territorial bull and what oh we got the rhinos coming into picture now how beautiful is that you can see how the calf stand very close to the mom. Nice to get a view of the, the baby's face. 
And you can see every now and then that baby puts its head down to feed, but always looking up, watching what's happening. So that, that wildebeest, it's actually marking its territory on that branch. James, I agree. Uh, very, very nice to see rhinos. And uh, these rhinos are probably 20 meters away from us. Uh, they're not bothered whatsoever about us going about their day feeding. Very nice to, to see rhinos. Also very nice to see um, a couple of other species all together. I mean, those impalas, wildebeest, zebra. And it, it actually looks like it's, it's all male impalas. I can see all of them have horns and they're all feeding on the, the small shrubs in this area. I don't know if you can see that one, that one feeding there on the branches. And it seems like they're all similar age. Um, we call it a bachelor herd. And it's all the, the younger males that have been kicked out by dominant male impalas within their harem. And they've come together to form that bachelor herd. It's a, it's a safety and numbers thing. And that's also why you can see so many of the animals all together here. They're up on this little ridge line. You can imagine the, the view that we have from up here. Uh, they can scan quite far into the distance, looking out for any potential predators such as lions, maybe cheetah, things like that out in these open areas. Don't know if you managed to hear that, but I can hear one of the, the zebras calling. Maybe potentially one of the stallions. Um, I, I can also see one young zebra there. Um, I can't get a view of them now. And also just before we, um, just as we came here, there were lots of young wildebeest all standing up, running around, playing with one another. But it seems like they've all started to, to settle down. You can see a lot of them are lying down. The last couple of days here on Anby on Pinda have been extremely hot. So I think they're making use of this cooler, cloudy weather out here. I can actually see those two zebras, they're actually grooming one another. How amazing is that? Yeah, crazy. And you can imagine there where the main starts, you can imagine that there might be a couple of ticks around there. Oh, brilliant, sure. There was actually two zebras that were just mating on the left-hand side that Glenn pointed out. It's the first for me seeing zebras mate. I've seen a, a couple of other animals mating before, including rhinos, which is quite a, an amazing thing to see, but never a zebra, so that was quite interesting to see. Seems like the, the rhinos are slowly starting to, to move off into the distance. The youngster seems to have calmed down a little bit and he is starting to feed quite a lot. The, the direction that these rhinos are actually heading in, there, there is a little water hole, not too far away from where these rhinos are. They could be heading there for their, their late afternoon drink. I'm just hoping and David, um, other animals would definitely, thank you for your question, other animals would definitely feel safe around rhinos. I mean, particularly in this area with the, I mean, the rhinos, the zebra, wildebeest and parlor, the, the rhino is not a threat to the wildebeest at all. Um, so they wouldn't be scared of them. They would often be in the same area. And you can imagine all these animals are grazers, so feeding off um, the grass around here. And I mean, it might be quite a nutritious area where these animals are. That's also why they, they gather in the same area, but also for safety and numbers. I mean, you can imagine more eyes, the better chance they have of spotting something like a cheetah in this area. So there's no, no threat at all um, with the rhinos and wildebeest and etc. around here. But it's a, a beautiful scene we've got going here, the, the rolling mountains of the west of Pinda Private Game Reserve and all these animals moving around us. You can imagine that oh, this rhino now seems to be coming a little bit closer towards us. 
might be very nutritious right around this area. She seems to almost be going in circles feeding. And you can imagine such a big animal such as a rhino has to constantly feed to keep up that energy. Constantly moving, feeding, they must use a, a huge amount of energy throughout the day. And I think especially now, I don't know if you can hear, it's very, very windy at the moment here, but uh, they're making use of this cooler weather. Not, uh, nice to, to see that youngsters calm down a little bit. And see ya. Kiana, thanks for the question. Um, so that rhino calf on the right hand side there, if you, it's quite easy to identify the age of calves um, in particular. So if you look at that calf, you can see the front horn is, is quite prominent. And I'm having a look as we speak in our, my binoculars and I can't see the, the second horn. I can just start seeing it. It's a little, little bump. Um, so I would estimate that this calf is probably just under a year old, around a year old. Um, that second horn starts to grow at around a year. I hope that answers your, your question. But uh, it's quite difficult when it comes to aging um, bigger rhinos such as that, that female on the left hand side. Um, just because rhinos, I mean, they, they live a, a long amount of time. Rhinos in particular, white rhinos, they can live to around 40 years old or so. Um, and so it's quite difficult to, to age this particular female. If I have a closer look at her ears, her ears are, are quite rugged. I can see the one on the left hand side is, is flopping down a little bit. So I can imagine she is quite an old female, potentially been in this area for, for quite a while. You can see the, the youngster getting a little bit closer there to the wildebeest. It'll be quite interesting to see what happens if the youngster does get quite inquisitive and, and go towards those wildebeest, what they'll do. Oh, there you can see one of the young wildebeest just stood up. Indy, thanks for the, the question. So rhinos, they can hang out in big groups. Um, we call it a crash. So when there's often a couple of rhinos together, what it might be is that it's often a couple of females with their calves that come together to form a crash. Um, and then often you get the territorial males, the bull rhinos that are often solitary. And they might once every while come into the crash um, and spend a little bit of time feeding with them and then move off. Um, personal story, but I've actually, the largest crash of rhinos I've ever seen on Pinda was up in the northeastern parts of the reserve, um, up, in, up in an open grassland, and it was 16 white rhinos all together. Um, there was lots of females with their calves, and the tracker I was working with um, has been on Pinda for about 30 years, and he lifted up his binoculars and looked, and in and amongst this um, group of white rhinos was one black rhino in and amongst this group. So that was, was quite amazing to see. Look at this little standoff we've got going here with the rhino and the, the wildebeest. That youngster wants nothing to do with those wildebeest. But I mean, the, by looking at the size, the white rhino is much bigger compared to those blue wildebeest. I think they'll give it a good run for its money. It's amazing now, when we, when we came, we saw lots of youngsters standing, and it seems like they've all tucked themselves up, excuse me, right next to their mothers, maybe trying to protect themselves from the wind out here. Seems like the impalas have also slowly moved off down into the valley. They might be heading towards a little bit more of a, a thicker area to try and take cover from this wind. Just amazing to spend so much time with, with rhinos so close to us. If I have a look closely at the 
So I think we're going to leave these rhinos and wildebeests and zebras. Um, seems like they, they settled down here. This rhino seems like she's feeding around. We're going to continue. I can see some giraffe off in the distance. See if we can maybe go get a closer look at those giraffe. And we're going to send you over to Steve. Well, thanks very much, Chad. Wonderful to spend time with rhinos. We are with another odd toad hindgut fermenter, the Birchills or Plains zebra, who are enjoying the grazy out here on the open plains. The elephants that were feeding on the marula tree cleaned up quite nicely and then all moved off. So we've left them to their movements. They went into the thickets, no point following up. And this fellow on the right, and you see the scar on his side there. Is that a scar? Looks like it might have been. Oh, it's just interesting patterning. Look at how that fits together. Very nice. It's actually a lady. Excuse me, madam. I do apologize. With their fly swatters very actively defending their rear ends. Quite a mixture. Animals are around still. The impala haven't moved. The wildebeest have just crossed the road, but the zebra are pretty much in the same place. And notice where they are feeding. They're feeding on the vegetation that's growing pretty much around the termite mound. So we talk often about the nutrient cycling that takes place with regards to termites. And even though there's lots of vegetation out and about, the zebras are focusing on feeding on the grass that is right there by the termite mound. It's much higher in nutrients, probably tastes better. Might even be able to smell it. We don't really have the faculty to, to delve into that depth, but when you pick up a, a beautifully organically grown apple versus one that's probably not as organically grown, it's very sure there's a very big difference in the smell and the flavor. Hello, Jeremy. Male and female zebras, oh, it's, it's not always easy to tell. Females often, when they are pregnant, they've got a very big belly on them, and male, so their behavior is often a telltale sign. The male zebra is slightly bigger and will often place himself between you and the herd, but the easiest way is having a look right there under the tail. The female's got a very thick black stripe or G-string. Both of them are female. That is indeed the feminine parts there versus the male who's just got a very thin g-string stripe so see if we can spot a male in amongst the herd lots of females there's possibly that one who's standing side onto us might be a male the males are and they generally put themselves between you. You can tell by a behavioral point of view, you don't always get the opportunity to see the bum. Well, the zebras are classic at showing us the African salute, which is the rear end. But a male zebra will often stand between any threats and his harem of females. So that youngster in the middle of frame is a young boy. Essentially looking under the skirt, everybody. Okay, well, Tristan Dix is out as well this afternoon. I have a feeling he was heading on down south towards Chitra. Let's go catch up with him and see how he's getting along. Well, we have finally decided to come to the party this afternoon. And as you can see, we have a wildebeest bull by himself looking rather normless as they normally do. Um, they are generally not the most entertaining of characters, although sometimes babies can be quite fun. My name is Tristan, on camera I've got Impor, and it's a very warm welcome, and I say warm because it's hot and humid today with the cloud cover that we've got. Um, it's fairly, fairly kind of uncomfortable is probably a good word for this. Um, 
And hopefully um, those kind of uncomfort levels are going to mean that we're going to see some of our cats trying to go towards water or up into trees. Um, I'm busy trying to follow up on Subui and the cubs as well as um, there was um, guinea fowls that were alarm calling down towards Chitto, which could be for Tundi's cubs. So we're kind of trying to find either one of them at this stage. So far, no luck. Um, but that's not to say that we won't. We're going to go check the last position of Sibui's cubs now, um, see if we can find them in this long grass. There's an impala that's coming bolting past for some un known reason. Um, maybe it's decided that uh, it's uh, time to leave the wildebeest and go and join the rest of the herd, which has prompted the wildebeest to now follow it towards where the rest of them are. It's a clever wildebeest. It's kind of hanging around where all the others are, um, making sure that it uses the impalas as almost a little bit of a safety blanket. Um, but it is, like I say, incredibly warm. So I'm hoping what's happened is that the, the two cubs have decided to move and have gone towards where the, the sand is because the sand will be a lot cooler um, than the surrounding vegetation, um, particularly because when the sun was out, it was quite brutal. And where they were lying this morning, they would have gotten some sun. So hopefully we'll get them there. Um, I don't think those two would have moved too much. I suspect that they are um, just lying up. Sabui so might have because there was another female leopard calling this morning, late this morning. Um, in this area um, and so maybe she heard that and has gone to go and respond to that um, which I would guess would be Tandy. All right so we're going to leave our wildebeest who's well just doing wildebeesty things and we're going to send you across to a far more entertaining creature in the form of Taylor McCurdy so she can say good afternoon. Well, I don't know how much entertainment I'm going to be for you, as well, the rains are about to pour down on Pridelands, as you can see from that very scary cloud in the distance, and you can actually see all the rain falling, but beautiful nonetheless. My name is Taylor McCurdy, as Tristan said, and on camera with me today is Ghat, and we are here at Pridelands Conservancy, which is part of Blue League Game Reserve and the Greater Kruger National Park. And now, I don't know how long we're actually going to be out here for. Firstly, because I don't want to get struck by lightning. <laughs> Neither does Ghat. Ghat, how do you feel about lightning? Not great. I apologize if there's a bit of wind um, noise. Yeah, the wind is just sort of gusting quite hectically at the moment and the thunder is rumbling. Now, the reason why we have sat here is we're hoping to see um, a beautiful bolt of lightning come straight out of the clouds and, and make contact with the ground. Well, that's the, the goal anyways, because uh, there was quite a bit of it, but we don't want to risk our lives, so we're not going to stay here for too long. But you can clearly, clearly see that these clouds are filled with raindrops and um, it's oh there we go there's actually some just on the left we just missed it so we this is the hardest part is playing the game of will we catch the lightning is the camera pointed in the right spot and the lens unfortunately is only so wide um so it's it's super super interesting to just see how this has happened you can just see the drakensberg mountains i don't think you'll be able to see them unfortunately but how is that view though so it started brewing uh, just to the south of us and there's a bit of thunder. I can even feel the car vibrating, which is crazy. And once this rain settles in, I don't think that it is going to stop uh, as they have forecasted rain until the early hours of this morning. We were hoping it was gonna lie, we were gonna be able to stay out here till about 6 p.m. But I think that our drive might be cut a little bit short as that is not the kind of rain that you really want to be stuck out in. And we have to be very careful at uh, Pridelands, especially where our camp is, as we are sitting almost on a flood line. It's a, well, it is a flood plain where the eco training camp is settled, and in Dlovu Dam is incredibly full at the moment. Um, so, <laughs> the last thing that we want to do is have to get life jackets out and canoes. Can you imagine paddling around there? But with all this rain, hopefully, we'll have some amphibian creatures tomorrow morning, too. Um, I know Mike was lucky enough to watch African bullfrogs um, play about and he got some great 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 shots and it's something that i haven't seen for years and i'm super envious so i hope that Khat and i get the opportunity oh were you with him 
No, it was Sebastian. Okay, so Khat hasn't seen it either. Um, so we're hoping that we get the chance to see some African uh, bullfrogs trying to fight for mating rights and who knows, maybe some other creatures too. The new year has arrived and with it comes all kinds of other new beginnings. From hyena cubs to meerkat pups, the bush is full of new life. If you want to find out more, then sign up to be an explorer and join our New Beginnings Fireside Chat. Tristan and Steve will be looking at what's new here in the wilderness as we enter 2021. Join them on the 17th of January, straight after the Sunset Safari. My name is Lauren and I'm currently working in Juma Private Game Reserve here in South Africa. I love answering your questions during the live safaris. It's my favorite part. It feels like you're on the vehicle with me and I'm able to teach you exactly what you want to know. If you want to ask a question on Wild Earth, then you need to register on our website. Once registered, you must go to the live safari page and ask your question below the live feed. For the month of January 2021, we are offering a chance to win a unique Wild Earth expedition to the magnificent Swalu Kalahari. From the ancient Kortai's Karanaberg Mountains to the southern Kalahari's red sand dunes, Swalu offers what travelers crave most, space and time. The winner will explore this landscape in a vehicle, on foot, or on horseback with a chance to go behind the scenes with Wild Earth and of course meet the meerkats. The prize includes a three night stay for you and a friend at the luxury Mozi Lodge including flights from either Johannesburg or Cape Town. Open to all Wild Earth explorers who have signed up before the end of January 2021. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back, everybody. It seems like the elephant spirit is strong with us this afternoon. The ticket to finding them is just to track down the marula trees, and we will find the elephants. They are loving the fruits, and this big mama here is enjoying the bark. There's lots and lots of medicinal properties with the marula, and histamine being a very, very big one. Bark's very, very bitter. As we know, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. Most medicine is very bitter. The elephants don't seem to mind. They know the benefits. I'm just going to keep quiet for a moment and I to listen to the sounds. of eating and ears flapping. <laughs> We've got a little fellow who's being very cheeky in front of us here. Very cheeky little fellow. He's now going to pretend to eat. Hello little one. It's right here next to us. He's busy eating the grasses. I'm going to try and damage the silver cluster leaf tree and show us how strong he is. So, with regards to the marulas, apart from us being able to us being able to make them into a very nice, delicious drink and ferment them into beer, fruits are very high in vitamin C, and the seeds inside can be used for insecticide, or should I say, the fruits themselves can be used for insecticide. Quite often you'll find the elephants after eating the fruit will actually, some of them are able to break 
the kernels with the seeds inside. Not many are, but sometimes they are able to break them. Very edible inside, the little nut that comes out of the kernel. Very rich oil, high in protein. What I love about the marula and the, the local calendar, the Tsonga or Shangan calendars, they flower in October. So they actually don't have a, back in that they didn't have actual calendar when sort of they flowered, that was sort of their October month. And the fruit started showing themselves in November and then January through to February was harvest time. Let's quickly send you over to Tswali. Alrighty guys, so we've left the cheetahs momentarily, but look at how cool this is. You know, that one giraffe decided he's gonna take this Sunday after, uh, Saturday afternoon quite easy. So he's laying down while they chewing on that salty rock. Um, with the Kalahari being so, you know, the soil itself being rather nutrient poor, you'll quite often find the animals having to practice what we call geophagia, you know, when they eat a little bit of sand or chew on a rock like they're doing right now, uh, just to get in all the mineral salts that they lack, especially now during growth season, you know, when the plants are growing extremely fast. The minerals inside the plants is not always sufficient enough for the animals, especially as large as a giraffe, to be able to uh, continue. They sometimes lack them a little bit, so you'll find them um, eating some sand or chewing on a rock or anything like that just to get in that extra minerals that they need to keep going. Also, you'll find giraffe quite often um, walking around with a, bone, uh, with a bone in their mouth, and that's just to get in some extra calcium. They suck it like a lollipop. They'll chew on it as well, and that we call osteophagia when they lack a little bit of calcium. Yeah, but just very cool to see all of these giraffes here all together. Uh, there's a waterhole just to the right of us. That one that I said the cheetahs will most likely hunt towards. Um, so they actually came down to have a drink of water, but they're also now gathering around that salt rock. Cindy, you're absolutely right. And we're not too far away from these giraffes so it's actually quite cool to see the giraffe lying down like that you know you don't often have them allow you to get too close when they lie down uh, because they are in such a vulnerable position when they lie down uh, so very very cool sighting uh, also just to see all of these boys all together you know with a giraffe they do have a, a more of a gypsy like life uh, more of a they don't have a permanent family structure, so we call it a temporary association. So these guys might break up tomorrow, move in separate directions and do their own thing. But always cool to see so many giraffes together. And notice how much lighter they are in color than the ones that you'll find in places like, let's say, Kruger or so. Just because it pays off for them to be more blonde in color. It's not like they lack pigmentation or anything like that. If you have to shave off all of their hair now, the skin will still be black but the blonder coloration on the animals definitely pays off because there's not a lot of big trees here which they can hide underneath, also not very thick. Um, so the vegetation now, so with that being the case, they need to be able to, as, to reflect as much sunlight as possible away from their bodies so as to not overheat during the day. But yeah, super cool to see that young boy lying down like that. And like I said, I think he was just not in the mood for bending down like this guy is doing in front of us right now. He's taking the easy option. There's no real threat for them at the moment close to this waterhole. It's only the cheetahs that we know of as far as predators is concerned. So with that being the case, they don't really need to worry about too many things. Cheetah will never go for an adult giraffe or even a sub-adult. They're just too big and too powerful. So they can absolutely just relax and enjoy the the rocks at the moment and then i'm pretty sure when the they've had their fill of the the saltiness or 
the ones that's still drinking water has had enough, they'll start moving into the distance and start feeding again for this afternoon. So now, T, that's a very good question. With the giraffes, they can grow quite tall. So the males, typically, well, you'll get them anything between, I want to say, four and a half up to as high as 5.2 meters. Um, and the females, they'll grow up to anything between four to 4.2, for uh, exceptional cases, maybe four and a half meters in height. So a big, big height difference between the males and the females up to, you know, if you take both extremes, up to about 70 centimeters. Um, taller so very very tall um, I mean and as you can imagine with them having that height advantage their sense of sight is absolutely their most valued sense because you'll be able to see over treetops and you know quite a long way away to spot danger and all of those things so that's definitely their most valued sense it does get them into trouble sometimes because they have such good sight they always want to see what's going on. So I've seen a couple of occasions where the curiosity gets the better of them. And, you know, there might be a, a lion moving in the distance and it moves behind a bush. And they want to see where the lion is going so they actually go closer to see over the bush or so. And by the point where they can see the lion, that lion went and lied down behind the bush and then they get themselves into trouble like that. So, yeah, quite funny when that happens. It doesn't mean that the lion will attack them every time but they do get a, a mini heart attack when that had, when that does happen but yeah very very tall animals i mean uh, as you can imagine we know we all know they're the, the tallest mammals on earth land mammals now but uh, you know when you see them like that it doesn't always necessarily seem like they're five meters tall until you go and stand right next to them, then you then you realize the height is quite significant. So yeah, guys, I think we're gonna stick with them a little while, see what they're gonna have, be up to, then maybe check up on the cheetahs again. Um, it is still nice and warm, so I think there's still gonna be flat cats, but for the meantime, we're gonna go over to the rhinos in Pinda. Welcome back, everybody. So we've just come down to a prominent waterhole um, out in these western parts of Pinda, and we've come across this beautiful bull rhino. And I think we just missed him drinking. Um, he was down right at the water's edge, and he just moved a little bit further away. I can actually see his, his two front feet are quite muddy, so that means that he was in the sludges along the edge of the water and you can see there's a, a couple of birds sitting on this male white rhino those are red-billed ox pickers and they're sitting on that rhino picking off all the the ticks and insects that might be living on those soft areas of the rhino particularly in between the legs behind the ears maybe even under the neck um, and that rhino sometimes gets a little bit annoyed with those red bulls ox pickers. Sometimes you see the, the ox pickers flying around the nose and trying to get into all areas of the, the rhino, and it doesn't particularly like that. But this particular rhino looks quite dark in color. And I think just like the, that female and calf we saw earlier, potentially during the, the middle of the day when it was extremely hot. Might have even been at this exact same water hole um, rolling around in the, the mud trying to cool off. Um, but there is a, a couple of drops starting to, to fall on Pinda. There does also seem to be a, a storm starting to brew and roll in here um, at Pinda. As you can see that rhino is just relaxing on the, the other side of the water. There goes that red-billed ox picker flying off. Oh, you can have a, a look at the nose there. Oh, there, the red-billed ox picker just flew off. Glenn, some good camera work there. Just what I was talking about earlier. The ox picker flew right towards the rhino's nose. And you can see he's just starting to, to move off a little bit. 
You might even just be standing still there, listening to us. If you have a look, you can can see his ears moving quite a lot. There is also quite a racket coming from the right-hand side of us. I can see a lot of weavers weaving their nests up in the tree here. It's quite an uh, amazing sound. And even to watch those weavers weave their nests, incredible birds they are. I can see some of them flying off and going just off the the water's edge around the, the dam to, to get grass and flying back. And it's just amazing how they craft these nests. And very, very vocal birds these weavers are. I can see the, the rhino coming a little bit closer to us on the left. He's very relaxed with us, just moving past us continuing on his day. So this might be a, a territorial male in this area. Um, he could be maybe after his drink on his uh, territorial patrol, maybe going to, to smell. I can actually just see he's smelling um, at a rhino midden. So it's an area where other rhinos would drop their dung, um, females, males, and the male will be able to, to pick up the scent of females that potentially are in estrus, um, ready to mate. And if this is the case, this male would follow the scent of that cow rhino and potentially then go and see if she is ready to mate. I mean, we did see those, the zebras mating. It might be the mating season. You never know. Um, so what we're going to do, we're going to stick around this waterhole. We did see some buffaloes off in the distance. Uh, it seems like they might be heading down towards the water. We're going to send you over to Tristan, who's in a search. Well, we still trying to find Sabui and the cubs. We're down in the drainage line and they're not where we left them. Um, but it is stifling inside here in terms of the humidity and the heat. It's really very, very warm. So I'm just trying to check to see if I can see any sign of them um, on this sort of sandy area where it's a little bit cooler. Um, I thought maybe, just maybe, they might kind of have made their way. But if you look in front of us, there is some water there. It's not very good quality water, so I don't think they're drinking that. Um, but... I was hoping that there was going to be somewhere maybe on the edge of these little water points because that wet sand is often much cooler than the surrounding area. But down in this drainage line at the moment, it is there's no air whatsoever. There's no kind of movement of air and it's very high humidity. So it would be uncomfortable for them like it is for us. And that generally means that they like to move and do certain things. But I can't go any further than this, even though the car can go. Um, there's a lodged right in front of us here so it's as far as we're allowed to go um, so that's not ideal uh, don't know where else to check for these two now because I've checked pretty much everywhere that is possible with the car it's also very possible that I'm driving right past them I briefly had a little incident with the car um, we had our there's a kind of an arm that fell into the viscous fan which is never an idea I mean ideal all right, so apparently Steve has got something, so we're going to send you across to him. Hello, everybody. We're going to show you something very cute in a second. They don't run away. There's little two mama warthogs with three little piglets. Just gone on the left over here. All the piglets wanted to do was suckle. All mum wants to do is to walk away. I've just been wallowing. Just through here. We're on a road called Ingwe Alley where there's lots of little mud wallows. There we go. Uh, don't run. It's okay. Sorry, little piglets. <laughs> now, we're talking this morning about... Uh, how long the grass is and how difficult it must be for us to find animals. Can you imagine being a warthog? 
where everything's above head height now. Everything wants to eat you, and you can't really get through it all because it's all above your head. And a mama, two females, and three piglets. It's a lovely road we're going to go and drive along now called Ingwe Alley with lots of little wallows. <laughs> yeah, I don't think the piglets or the pigs themselves are going to uh, wallow again, but you never know. We've also got a couple uh, elephants on the right hand side. We might get a better view of them in a moment. Definitely lots of elephants around this morning. Lots of them do come to this part of the world in the summer because of the marulas. This is the marula felt. Kaylee wants to know if I ever get nervous around the animals. I think Kaylee actually tried to ask that question just before when we were with elephants. Kaylee, I've spent years with elephants and years with many of these big animals. And uh, there's always a feeling inside the tummy, but you've got to listen to your your your, your tummy. You listen to what's going on inside, and uh, definitely understanding the behaviour of the animal is key. And I mentioned before that uh, when we see elephants and they all spread out and they're feeding and the youngsters are visible, then there's nothing going on with that herd. They're very relaxed. But of course, when you encounter a herd like what we would now, I can just see some in the distance. If they start to react to us now, then you be very careful. You've got, to, you've got to get out of the way. So then, yes, you can feel a little bit nervous. But uh, nerves are important because they heighten the senses. But don't ever be complacent. Um, elephants can be different every day. Elephants come from all over the Kruger Park down to this part of the world from the Marulas, but generally the elephants that we find here in the Sabi Sands are very, very relaxed. We never have too much of an issue with them, but that doesn't mean all elephants are like that. Some elephants up in the north, when I worked up in the northern Kruger, elephants are a very different breed up there. It's because they go over to Mozambique and Zimbabwe a lot more, and those elephants react to people very, very quickly. I spent a lot of time on foot with them up in the north, and the objective in that case is to not let them know at all that you're around. That's key. Uh, when you're in a vehicle, though, elephants know very quickly whether you're around or not. They can hear you, and they will react quite quickly. And you'll know quite quickly if an elephant is not happy. You don't have to look at the subtle signs. Elephants feeding like this are very, very relaxed. Uh, let's quickly send you over to Tristan Honchitra. Well, at least we've had uh, some success. Um, <laughs> victory in the form of a spotted coat um, is certainly a welcome surprise this afternoon. I, as I suppose not really a surprise we were looking, but we found her. We haven't found the cubs, um, but a little bit of perseverance. At least we've managed to find Subui, who's up and moving, which I'm surprised about given the heat factor. Um, I would have thought that she was going to be taking it fairly easy in this heat. You can see she's not nearly as full as what Shasha was um, this morning. And so maybe she's just trying to find some semblance of food. I'm just trying to see where she's going to go. Don't go in the drainage line, please. Looks like she's going to go up the road. All right, cool. Let's just turn. I don't think Rusty's in doing as well as it wants or should be doing. Um, something doesn't feel all that great with the steering, but it's fine. We'll still be able to drive the car. We should be able to kind of keep going with it. Um, but if you hear an odd noise every now and then, it's just Rusty being, well, Rusty. Um, but I wonder where she's off to. Hopefully she's going to call at some point and that will bring the other two with her uh, but I doubt it I suspect that this is now uh, a hunting um, sort of patrol that she's gonna go on now um, you can hear the squirrels are starting to alarm call um, they're shouting at her um, and so hopefully she'll be good to us and just kind of stay on the road itself I've lost visual of her oh, there she is in the drainage line go around because I'm hoping she's going to pop out onto this road here. Unfortunately that drainage line is 
way, 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 way too dense and too steep and too undulating for us to actually get into. So it's not even going to be worth the effort to try get in there because all we're going to do is end up getting ourselves stuck or to break the car and we don't really want either of those issues um, so we'll rather just come from the bank also the direction she's heading should pop her out onto our side um, she's been moving kind of this way this more this afternoon Kendra, so um, it's always a, an interesting one. Uh, sometimes she gets a little bit aggressive with them where she'll snarl and hiss and just kind of make a lot of noise and try and just give them a, a very clear indicator um, that she's not happy with them and that they must leave her alone. Um, sometimes it's just in body language, so her tail starting to twitch and her the way that she starts to move, um, that's, there she is on the left here, um, that will often kind of show the cubs, okay, it's time to leave me alone, I'm busy with things. And ultimately the cubs know that if they actually leave mom alone properly, um, they're going to benefit from it because they're ultimately going to um, get food uh, so they typically once they see mom kind of getting a bit agitated a bit snarly then they leave um, and they kind of leave her alone to go and do her own thing but she's really not walking the ideal route um, I suppose not ideal for us but ideal for her because it's going to be seriously tricky to follow her through this um, I'm hoping she is gonna pop out we're gonna try keep up with her as much as we can in the meantime though let's send you back across to Steve Thanks, Tristan, and well done for finding Subui. Hopefully she's successful this afternoon. We just had this big elephant bull join a herd of elephants that we found. And the size of him is enormous. He's a very, very big boy. But uh, to get back to the question before about should we be nervous? Now, look at these elephants. They, they've got babies. You can see the babies. Look at the little baby between that one's legs on the left. He's a little one. That's a brand new little baby. Now, they're often hidden underneath mum's legs, but uh, the fact that you can actually see it like this in the open is <laughs> indication that the herd's relaxed. They were busy feeding, they were busy throwing dust. And obviously, breeding herds are a little bit more sort of cautious than big bulls. No one's really going to bother that big elephant bull, so they're far more sort of passive. But breeding herds are always looking out for their youngsters. So telltale signs are heard motionless, not doing anything, just listening. I heard shaking their heads from side to side with trunks in the air. And uh, if you can see their eyes, if their eyes are flared open, flared open wide, or stiff tails, you see those tails, they are very sort of hanging and soft. A stiff tail, a head held high, trunks in the air. Very good indication that something's not 100% okay. And actually, as we were approaching, <laughs> look at that little baby. As we were approaching that, this herd, that some of the youngsters and the adults itself had her trunk in the air and they're having a look. And that was because those warthog that we saw ran in amongst towards the elephant. And so elephants are quite a wary or cautious of of small sort of animals moving through the grass. It could be lion, it could be leopard. And once they figure out that it is in fact a warthog, well, they'll just shake their head at it and it'll leave. Okay, let's just go back here quickly. This big bull, sorry, Marcello, this big bull here is trying to break a little young marula. Surely he should be able to break that quite easily. Tell me when you got him. Okay, so we weren't able to finish our Marula discussion before. Sclerocaria berea. Very, very common tree, especially on the granitic soils here, on the western side of the Kruger. Timavati, Belule, where Taylor is. Ngala. This whole western granitic side, very, very commonly found with the silver clust leaves. And the Marula is generally on the higher places. And the leaves are very good for indigestion. 
as you can imagine, elephants are eating lots of food, and so they need a little bit of bit of medicine for their tummy. We could use it as indigestion. You chew it, you get an astringent, which is sort of like a paste in your mouth. And if you can swallow that, it will help with your indigestion. It's very, very pungent, or should I say potent to swallow. It's very bitter. But the bark and roots, we can use decoctions of it for treating all sorts of stomach ailments. So no doubt elephants who've got an enormous digestive system will be able to use the bark and the roots through the fermentation process to assist with diarrhea, dysentery, peptic ulcers, as well as coughing. I've had an elephant once with a cough, it was quite something to witness. You can never tell who it was because it never lifted a hand to the mouth. <laughs> Just hear the oh. Lean, 11 years old. Well, he is, oh, you say you love how they're shaped like Africa. Well, it's exactly what they're shaped like, the African elephant. Nice big ears for these warm climates for cooling themselves down. The Indian elephant is a much more tropical climate. Their ears are far smaller, a little bit more round, but serve the same purpose. Now he's enjoying himself some silver cluster leaf which um, is even more bitter than that of the marula. And you find quite a few animals this time of year feeding on the silver cluster leaf, giraffe, kudu, elephant. It's not too much medicinally in the leaves themselves, but it's possible he's going for the pods there. We know that pods and fruit are often designed for being eaten so that they can be distributed and through the digestive system of the elephant. They'll be deposited further away from the parent plant, which is ideal. If you don't want your kids stealing your shade, your sun and your nutrients. guys so we've left those giraffe we had a look at the um, male cheetahs as well they're still looking very flat so we're just doing a little bit of a bumble around see if we can find something else possibly bump into there's a spotted hyena not the one that we went for this morning a different female that has a well that operates in this area as well so maybe if we pick up on some fresh tracks we might be able to pick up on her as well which would be great uh, I haven't seen her in a while uh, but there's still yeah, there's lots of giraffe in the in the area. We're going to drive past some now. I'll show you. You can just see their heads sticking out over the treetops at the moment. But yeah, um, just scanning the road here. She comes into that waterhole where the giraffe was busy feeding on the salt rocks quite a, almost every night. So um, if we can pick up on on some tracks, possibly locate her and see how she's doing. And then when it starts cooling down properly, we'll. We'll start heading towards the um, cheetahs again and see if they don't want to get a little active. There was luckily some oryx and some springbok also in the clearing where the wind is coming from. So that's always positive. There you can see the, the giraffe now. Uh, especially with them that will be looking to hunt, well, from what I think, in that direction. So uh, the signs are there. The animals are there, they just have to be hungry enough to, or, and or smart enough to go in that direction to be able to go for the, you know, to find those springbok and the oryx and so on, because there was a couple of young oryx as well, so they'll definitely be able to go for them also. Uh, so yeah, we're just trying to pick up on the hyena tracks at the moment, see what happens there, and if we find something, we're going to let you know, okay? Welcome back everybody. How amazing is this? The rhinos come back to drink. We've just had a herd of buffalo all around this waterhole drinking. Most of them have finished up drinking and are just on the, the edge of the water. 
but there's still two on the right hand side that are, are still drinking. This white rhino actually chased these two buffaloes away from the, the spot where they were drinking. Maybe he wanted the freshest water around. As you can see, all these buffaloes are, are just resting now, standing around, not feeding. There's a, one buffalo, Glenn, if you shine off to the left hand side, he's quite covered in mud. I know we've been talking about how animals in the heat of the day will often try and cover themselves in mud to protect themselves. And that buffalo has just done that. You can imagine how nice that little mud bath must have been for him after an extremely hot day. Oh, look at the rhino. Just lay down right in the water. How incredible is that? Just as we are talking about it, the rhino seemed to have listened to what I was saying. And you can imagine how that cools this rhino down. And just lying in the cold mud, the water on its body, cooling itself down. It's almost like this rhino is trying to protect the water from the buffalo. It doesn't want anybody else around the water. Some of those buffaloes are even looking at us, wondering what we're doing. Well, very good question. Um, how big is a white rhino? So white rhinos, the, the male and females differ in weight. White rhino males, often a, a lot bigger compared to a female. Um, I would say white rhino males, probably around a ton and a half, maybe even two tons, um, probably closer to two tons. Whereas a female, a little bit smaller, probably one and a half tons. Um, so it is a, a very, very big animal. Um, I will have a, a look in the, do some research, sorry, and have an exact look at how, how much they do weigh. But it's somewhere around two, two tons a white rhino would weigh. And then buffalo is probably a little bit smaller. Um, buffalo is probably the big bulls, the big male buffaloes, probably weighing about a, a ton, um, maybe just under 800 kilos or so. But just both of these animals are just huge animals. Look, there's two actually fighting there. I don't think it's too serious of a fight. I think they, they just play fighting with one another. It does, if I look through my binoculars, it did look like it was two males. Sorry, no, the one on the right is a, a female and the one on the left is a, a young male. And how I know that is if we can find maybe a, a big bull within this herd, we have a look at the, the crown, or we call it a boss, which is that the part of the horn on top of the head, and um, that the males have a, a very, very big boss, and the females, they don't have too much of a boss covering the head. And the reason for this is males, um, often to fight for dominance within a herd, would clash horns and fight. And you can imagine that they need that protective layer on top of their head. Um, you can imagine a ton, two tons of animal coming together at quite a, a pace. It must be quite a, a sound and quite something to, to look for. But uh, it seems like now these buffaloes are slowly moving off and that rhino is just happy as anything. That's a, a beautiful spot for him. I think a lot of us... Master, um, it's a very good question. Personally, I've never seen a rhino get stuck in the mud. Um, they are extremely powerful animals. And I think if they do feel that they are getting a little bit stuck, they'll, they'll try and get out. Um, however, I have heard of uh, an elephant before, actually here on and beyond Pinda, where we are at the moment, um, getting stuck in the mud. And it was up in the, the northern section of the reserve, and it was a very, very muddy waterhole, um, so there was not too much water around. And what he did was he, he walked into the water to try and get to, to the mud and a little puddle of water. 
and it was quite dry on the top and very wet underneath and he actually got himself stuck and we had to to call in the vet and the vet came and we eventually then had to help him out of the water with a, a TLB, which is a like a grader. We had to put some ropes around him and actually give him a bit of a boost out of the, the water. Luckily, one of the rangers did find him at a, the perfect time and um, that he wasn't stuck there for too long. Because you can imagine, I mean, elephant's such a big animal, constantly moving, constantly feeding, needing to get all that energy to be able to move. And with him not feeding, he wouldn't be able to to move a lot and use up that energy to try and get out. And I'm sure he would have used up a lot of energy trying to get out and then he'd probably just lay there um, waiting. But uh, I'm glad we did come around and save him, which is quite amazing. I can see that Ron has actually just closed his eyes. Uh, resting his head on the, the bank of the mud. It almost looks if you... Phoenix, so, uh, very good question. Um, so here where we are situated in South Africa, we get the two types of, of rhinos. Um, which is the, the black rhino and then the white rhino. The white rhino, oh, look at that. Sorry, that rhino was just rolling around. Um, so we get the two types, white rhino, black rhino. White rhino being the, the one in front of us. And the difference between them is white rhinos are grazers, so they feed off grass. Um, they'll be out in open plains areas feeding off grass, whereas the black rhino it's a browser. So what it does is it feeds off all the, um, the leaves and the trees and bark um, around. And there are also a couple of other differences, mostly the head and the shape of the, the lips. So white rhino has a, a very, very elongated um, mouth, almost like a lawnmower to be able to pick up a lot of the grass as it's grazing. Whereas a, white, uh, sorry, a black rhino has almost a, they call it the hook lip rhino, and it's got a, a little hook on the end of its lip, and that's to grab the, the branches, and then to break the branches off to feed. And also black rhinos are a little bit smaller than white rhinos. Black rhinos weighing anywhere around 800 kilograms, maybe a little bit less, and then like we said a little bit earlier, the, the white rhino is around two tons. Um, so yeah, that's, those are the, the main differences. Also, if you see it in the distance, what you can look out for is black rhinos will often have their heads up, um, looking around, looking for potential bushes to feed off, whereas white rhinos often have their heads down straight towards the ground because they're feeding on the grass as they, they're moving around the open grasslands. I don't know if you guys can hear, but those weavers are still going. Let's just take this in. I mean, this rhino wallowing. See if you can maybe hear the, the weavers building the nest. That rhino almost seems like it wants to roll himself over fully. Oh! Maybe he must roll onto the other side and be able to, to get himself caked in mud. He's actually drinking water at the moment. <laughs> James, I totally agree with you. He's enjoying a, a spa day out here. A nice little little mud spa. Very, very good for the skin. And what better way than mud? Yo, look at that. That's incredible. There we go. 
I can actually see, I'm looking through my binoculars at the moment, and there's actually a huge amount of flies. Oh, there he goes onto the other side. No ways. That's very, very incredible. Um, so I was talking just about the flies, and there's hundreds and hundreds of flies that are flying around that white rhino. And you can imagine with that mud caked on the skin, it will also protect him from those flies. I mean, I can imagine it might be quite annoying. I know for myself, with one fly flying around my head, I get, get quite annoying. So I mean, to have hundreds of flies flying around him, he wants to try and protect himself from those flies. It's actually given us a, a greater, great, a better view, sorry, um, of him. Maybe he's posing for the camera. I think he's going to give it one more. No. Frushy. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Um, I don't think that these animals will be able to get sick from the dirty water. Their, their stomachs are, are very, very strong. Um, they're able to, to digest a lot of the foods and things like that. I don't think they'll be able to get sick from drinking the water. Um, potentially, if there might be a disease that lives in the water, then I think they could get sick. Um, I must just do a little bit of research, but I, I have heard of rhinos in particular um, dying from drinking water um, that had a type of algae. It was called green algae. Um, and they drank that water and unfortunately um, passed away. So I'd, I haven't heard of many areas that that's happened. Um, but yeah, for the most part, they, they can drink the dirty water around. Oh, brilliant. Glenn's got some close-ups of the, the rhino with the, the mud on his face. And you can... He's literally carrying that mud away. <laughs> it almost looks like he's got a, a second horn now. And often rhinos will do that. Um, they'll cake their horn in mud. It's to make their horn look much bigger, much more impressive. Um, for their females. The, these rhinos here on and beyond Pinda have been um, dehorned. So what we do is we, it's a poaching prevention, so to, to try and prevent the poaching um, from happening. And we, we actually um, cut the rhino horns off the, the rhinos. Um, we haven't seen, which is a great thing, we haven't seen any negative impacts on the rhino um, dehorning itself, which is which is great to see, and we haven't had uh, much poaching in the last four years since we we've started dehorning our rhinos. But this rhino seems like he's oh maybe look at himself look at him sorry giving himself a nice little scratch there on that rock. Must be a oh that must be quite amazing for him. Maybe he's trying to get off all those little ticks and insects sitting around his mouth after he's caked it in mud, after his little spa day. Seems like also the, the buffaloes have started to move off a little bit further left from where that rhino is. And I think they're gonna continue feeding um, into the, the evening, as it starts to get dark there, they may start to settle down in a nice open area um, to rest for the evening. Okay, coming back on the weavers. Cool. We're gonna go back to the, the weavers. See if we can maybe get a, a close up of the, the weavers, maybe weaving their nests. There's a lot of fresh grass around this water hole that these weavers are using. And I think they might even be a little bit happier if we do get a little bit of rain. The grass might be a little bit softer and a, a little bit easier to, to weave. But they're actually very, very beautiful birds. Black face, very, very yellow. So I think 
We, we're going to move on from this waterhole. Seems like the, the animals that we had here have also moved off. We're going to see what else we can find and we're going to send you over to Steve. Thanks, Chad. Well, as you move away from your washing hole, we move towards one. This is called Treehouse Washing Hole. A warthog running away on the other side, hoping to just see what might be here. Always worth checking washing holes. And Chad's looking forward to some rain. Well, Taylor and Gert have taken some cover from the rain in Pridens. The rain is pelting down. It's only about as the crow flies, probably about 70 kilometers. And uh, that's not on its way here that I can see. But here we have Treehouse Dam. So we're going to be safe from the rain for now. But that's the beautiful thing about these low felt storms is you can see them coming. It's called orographic rain, which means it falls all over the place. It's not like this blanket rain that covers the entire area, although that does happen from time to time. These lightning storms move through the area and they only fall in very specific patterns. My grandfather was a farmer in northern Rhodesia, Zambia today, um, and he actually got bankrupt from the farming because the, fa the, the rain would fall on his neighbor's farm, right next door it would fall, and it would ignore his farm altogether. And that can only happen so many times without it affecting whatever it is you're trying to grow. So very localized storms. Here an orange breasted bush rock. <laughs> it's a nice place to check watering holes as we go along. I'm just going to be quiet for a moment while I scan with my binoculars. See if you can hear these wonderful little flittering birds. Some chirping with the grey headed sparrows, long distance sounds of the brown, black crowned chagra. We might spend another few moments scanning the watering hole while we send you over to the west with a fast cat. Okay, guys, so we're back with the cheetahs, and they definitely seem to be paying a lot more attention to what's going on around them at the moment. They, both of their heads just shot up, looking towards the dam. There's quite a few springbok and oryx and uh, the giraffe is still there, uh, which will complicate things for them a little bit if they should go that way. Um, but they're definitely starting to look like they are looking for something quite a bit more. Um, still lazy, as you can see, but they're starting to look up a little bit more frequently, um, laying up like that one on the on the right hand side. You can see he's lying on his belly instead of his side. So ready to just pop up the head and, and have a look whenever he needs to. So yeah, hopefully, hopefully we'll get lucky this afternoon. Um, we'll have to see. And it is going to be a patience thing, unfortunately. This wind picking up is also incredible for them to hunt, you know. Hides their sound and their smell and all of those things just so much more efficiently. So hopefully that'll work in their favor. It's, it's a little tough for them at the moment because the wind is not coming directly from any of the antelope species, so they they're not really smelling it or so. However, you know, 
they're hungry enough, they're going to start moving soon and they're going to locate on, on something at least. Emerald, so at this point where they are now, not yet, obviously with them, you know, not eating for a couple of days, their energy levels will go down a little bit and so on. But these guys are so, you know, they designed this way to be able to go a couple of days without food. You know, the, the thinner their belly, I want to say, the more um, energetic the hunt will be because they, they don't have to carry a lot of meat weight in their stomach around so that will be one thing however um, if they go like 10 days or let's say if they get to about seven days without eating that's gonna start compromising their their energy levels and also uh, make them a little weaker and and so on but as these guys are at the moment I would put them at roughly around um, 48 hours to maybe yeah, so two days to maybe three days without eating. So with that being the case, they're still very strong and very able to, to be able to hunt. When they go over that period, let's say, like I said, over seven days without eating or so, that's going to start making things a little difficult for them. Then they'll have to focus their attention a little bit more on smaller things, let's say a steenbok, which is not as fast and not as strong, so not requiring a lot of energy to take down. Get a little bit of energy in just to, you know, replenish the absolute need for food, and then they can start going for larger things like spring rock or like uh, young oryx or something like that but at the moment not yet they they're still strong enough to do what they need to do and they're at that point where they're now hungry enough where they'll actually go for something larger maybe than what they'll usually do like let's say a big oryx or something like that a female uh, adult female kudu or something um similar in size um whereas you know when they have still a little bit of meat left in the tank they might go for something smaller something like a springbok which they'll finish in one afternoon and it will just about fill their bellies completely so then they don't have to worry about the kill being stolen or anything like that but yeah guys i think we're gonna chill for with them for a little bit as we've mentioned they are looking a little bit more aware of what's going on around them so if there is something happening or if they start moving or so we'll come back here but for the meantime we're going to go over to Tristan okay well someone that's aware of her surroundings is Subway because she has somehow managed to trick us fool us and make us drive circles around this area we eventually managed to find her and you can see we kind of a very steep angle down on her and that's the only way we managed to see her is by coming right up tight against this drainage line which has been well quite an effort I, I feel like I've um, I don't even know done a 10 kilometer run from the off-roading that we've done we've had to go back and forth and round and it's been quite something um, the other two are also around um, so the male and little female are somewhere they kind of we keep getting visuals of brief sightings of one or the other moving through these thickets um, so I'm hoping that if we just stay with her now the other two will eventually arrive and we'll get all three of them back together again um, but they definitely have made us work hard that's for sure um, so mom is not hunting anymore she was at one point when we last saw her she looked like she was stalking something but maybe that ran away or just didn't feel like it and she's now kind of lying up and remember what i was saying early in the afternoon about how the sand is often cooler um, than anywhere else you can see she's lying in a particularly kind of wet piece of sand if you see that dark sort of coloration around her back feet um, you'll see that the there's a lot of moisture still in there and as that's evaporating it's causing cooling um, and so much more comfortable for a leopard on a hot day like this to lie there than it is to lie let's say hypothetically in a bit of grass in the shade um, a few centimeters away from where she is now um, so expected them to be somewhere in these kind of drainage lines this afternoon glad that we got lucky enough to actually see her because if we hadn't spotted her earlier um, there's no ways we would have found her here um, this is a very tricky spot and an area that is not easy to look 
Um, you also don't really want to be walking in these drainage lines at the moment with the grass being as high as it is. It's asking for trouble, that's for sure. Fast asleep though, isn't she? I wonder where the little boy was, because he was definitely behind her, but not far, and then I think the little female was further back. Um, sometimes it's easier to refer to them as little male and female. Um, it's a mouthful saying all of their names um, in one sentence, and it feels like a <laughs> kind of naming game to say Sabui, Shasha, and Langa. Um, so sometimes easier just to call it male and female. So Ulla, I wonder if it's Ulla who was recently in South Africa with us um, on a trip. Um, if it is you, Ulla, hello. Um, but Ulla, um, in weight, in terms of Tandi and Subui in comparison, um, I think it's pretty tricky to know 100% sure. Um, you'll find that um, these cats, obviously, it's, the weight is quite fluctuating when it comes to what they've eaten and various other things. But I suspect that you'll find Sabui will be heavier um, than what Tandi will be, just because of the fact that she is slightly larger. Um, but it won't be much. If it's if it's 10 kilograms, it's a lot. I, I wouldn't even think it's that much. Um, I'd probably say they're within sort of 10 to 15 pounds of one another um, in terms of weight. That's if both animals are kind of either thin or both animals are full. Um, if you had um, either animal kind of one full and one thin, then you might sort of compensate for that. But it's not a huge difference in weight, that's for sure. Just listening, it sounded like some guinea fowl started alarm calling just to the south of us. So but they haven't gone long. Generally, when guinea fowl alarm call, they make quite a lot of noise for a long time if they've seen a leopard. Um, but they seem like they've gone quiet already, so I don't think it's for her. Maybe a Wahlberg's eagle that came over. There's a few of them milling about. There's a pair that's been nesting on Chitwa um, ever since I've been in the area, which was, you know, all the way back in 2011. Um, they've been kind of nesting just down the drainage line where these guys are. So. They often fly over and cause a bit of panic for a lot of the birds, which makes it a lot more difficult for us um, in terms of being able to kind of find cats. Uh, often they throw you off a little bit. We now just need to be patient, I'm afraid, and wait and see whether or not she wakes up and if the other two join her. Hopefully if they do, then all three will walk together. Gabby, who's 12 years old. Um, Gabby, it's nice to have the younger generation watching today. Um, you're asking about Subui's spot pattern um, and what it is. And so I'm going to make 100% sure before I say this because obviously we don't want to get this wrong. Um, she's a cat that uh, we don't see as much, but she's, I think, 2-2 two, two is what I seem to remember. I just want to double check quickly. Um, yeah, two, two. So she's got two on the right, two on the left. Um, and for those of you that don't understand or don't know what we're talking about when we talk about spot patterns, is if you have a look at a leopard's face, um, they have um, a whisker sort of where the whiskers are. On top of that is a set of spots um, that runs from the kind of nose towards the cheek. And those spots are always different on every leopard. And so it's like a little fingerprint for them that we can utilize to make sure that we're seeing um, a different leopard or to, to know which leopard we are seeing. Um, so it's used a lot by researchers. Here, not so much because we see the cats so regularly that um, spot patterns are something that you don't really look at. You're generally seeing the cat from much further away. And yes, with a camera, when it's zoomed in, you can see those little whisker spots. But with the naked eye from 50, 60 meters, you can't see the spots on the nose at all or on the whisker line. Um, so it's more appearance that we go by, area, um, and then there's a few little markings that you can use on the body that are more useful than actually those whisker spots. Um, the whisker spots are good if you close up and you've got binos and you can kind of see them, but for the most part, it's very seldom that we would use um, whisker spots. I, I certainly don't really use it um, anymore. Um, it's not something that 
um, I find is that useful um, for us when we're guiding out here. Like I say, for research purposes, completely different, and for IDing from photographs, completely different. But from a practicality point of view as a guide, um, it's a lot harder to see um, spots. Like I say, now, I mean, you wouldn't be able to see a whisker pattern at all the way that she's lying at the moment. You use other things. Uh, but area is really kind of the easiest way and then the looks of them. A lot of you who have pets will kind of just know what your dog or cat looks like from afar um, just because you've repetitively seen them and you start to notice subtle differences in their facial structure, their ear shape, their body shape, whatever it may be. Um, and that indicates to you that it's your pet. And it's the same kind of thing with these guys is when you start to see them regularly, you start to understand that they have slightly different facial features. And um, it's actually amazing once you kind of get to that point it's easy to kind of tell the difference between these leopards and know when there's something doesn't look quite right and it's an individual that you're not 100 percent sure that you've seen before so um yeah but spots are obviously you know the easiest way for researchers they they certainly use it regularly all right we're gonna sit with her and just be patient i'm hoping the the two um, little hooligans will arrive um in this area um and they'll start to then play with mom do you dream of traveling to a far-flung wilderness location where life continues as normal? A place where you can escape to nature and breathe. If you become a wild earth explorer, then this could soon become a reality. Subscribe today and stand a chance to win regular travel prizes. Wild Earth Explorers, it's in your nature. Welcome to my car. This is Wendy, and she's my favorite. She would love to have your name engraved on her so you can be with her every single time she goes on a safari here in Juma. If you become a Wild Earth Explorer, you will have the opportunity to buy an engraved tag which we will attach to her. We will make sure to send you a digital picture to show you exactly where you are sitting on her. You will have front row seat in every single sighting. Our first Wild Earth Explorers competition has closed. And we have a winner. Congratulations to Chantal Sleep from Benoni in South Africa. I felt totally overwhelmed for winning this prize. I will be taking my son with me and I can't wait to share this experience with him. Chantal and her son have won a behind the scenes Wild Earth experience at the magnificent and beyond Ngala Tented Safari Camp. The prize includes a three night stay and a chance to sleep out in the unique Ngala Treehouse. I would like to thank Wild Earth for making this dream come true and I encourage everybody to subscribe to become an explorer and stand the chance to win these amazing prizes and so much more. For this month we have a brand new prize. You could be jetting off to Tuvalu in the Kalahari for a three night stay at the luxurious Motsi Lodge. Open to all Wild Earth explorers who have signed up before the end of January 2021. Terms and conditions apply. Welcome back to Juma, everybody, where we have moved on from our washing hole and found my favorite fragrant plant, the dwarf sage, sitting here on the dashboard. I don't know how I got on the dashboard. I'm only joking, I grabbed some. There's plenty of it around. Very water-loving plant. And why I grabbed it now is because the flowers are out. They're very beautiful sort of pinkish purple flowers or mauve or violet, whatever you'd like to say. But the leaves are very characteristic and easy to identify. You don't always see the flowers, but throughout the year, the plant is available. But now the flowers are available, which makes it easy to identify. But if you have a look on the leaves over here, you'll see on the side, see the entire plant seems to be made up of leaf, even the stem, but very broad leaves with two growing from inside, constantly growing, constantly growing, and I love this plant. I'm going to show you why. I'm going to just grab a little piece of it. Um, this is a plant that's very water loving and is found all over the place, but what you can do with the dwarf sage is you can crush it up, very aromatic. Oh. Those South Africans out there that know what Vic smells like. Mm. It opens your sinuses. And through my own personal experiments with students and K2 
camops and myself alike, it has got a sort of endorphin sort of attribute to it that after inhaling it, you feel a little bit sort of, okay, everybody, let's get with it. Marcel needs some as well. He's looking a bit flat in the back there. There we go, Marcel. So really, really good for cleaning out the sinuses and just opening things up. It smells really nice. And one thing that's really, really good, I know a friend who's uh, currently at Maholo Holo Rehabilitation Center, uh, which is not far from Hootsbret, and she's having to assist with animals and cleaning and pens and dung and all that. And this plant is ideal if you go into a lion carcass where there's dead animals and poo, or if you're having to clean out a cage where there's lots of poo. You just get it in the nose. And then um, you can deal with deal with anything. All you're going to smell now is this wonderful, very fragrant smell. And at the same time, you're going to open up your sinuses and cleanse your nasal cavities. And uh, I haven't been able to find any um, any sort of medicinal properties of it anywhere. Um, maybe I should start delving. Maybe I should talk to some of my, my old professors, see if I can get some analysis done on the plant. If any of you have come across any medicinal characteristics or properties of this plant, please feel free to send it through to me. I've searched. I haven't managed to find anything. It's a very abundant plant here throughout the Kruger in the wet areas. And the last two years, we've had a fair amount of rain. It's really, really taken off seems to be dominating now. Micanova wants to know if it's edible. I've done this before. Now, a lot of people cook with sage. Oh. Oh. No, it's not. <laughs> not very edible, Micanova. Now, me that was very strong. Excuse me while I just have a little wet. That was delicious. Marcel's cracking up on the back here. What is that? Was that a track? So the medicine or the phenols, which are obviously what we're smelling, the, um, the chemicals that we're smelling in there that are keeping it or make it very fragrant, so is what the plant is using and designed to keep it from being eaten. So whenever you find a very, very fragrant plant, I mean, most of the plants we use in the garden for herbs, so rosemary, lavender, um, thyme, oregonum, they're very, very strongly flavored plants. We've designed ourselves or developed a taste for them. But essentially what many of those plants are doing is creating a chemical within them to make them unpalatable. And unpalatable basically affects the plant's digestibility and then leads to animals leaving it alone. So you find lots of this around and you don't see any signs of feeding on it. Uh, I've never, never seen an insect feeding on the, the leaves themselves. I see many um, feeding on the flowers, but not on the leaves. So they don't necessarily want to be eaten. But um, make some lovely potpourri out of this. I'm think, thinking about making some of that. Jerome, that's a very good question, a very important one. Um, I've tried this one before, so I knew this one wasn't poisonous, but Jerome, the very easy thing to do to find out if a plant's poisonous, everybody should take note of this. There's a few steps to this, it's very, very important you do so. First thing is you take a stem or a leaf and you peel it off and you look for milky latex or any type of latex. No latex? Okay everything seems to be okay. Next stage is I'm going to take it and I'm going to rub it. So this is the same for fruits as well. Take it on a, on a, on a harder part of your arm, not the sensitive part, harder part. Rub it on there for a little while, maybe even the back of your hand. And if it causes any irritation, don't eat it. Okay. Now, if nothing happens there, go to the softer part of the arm, inside of the arm where it's a little bit softer. Do the same thing there. Give it a few minutes. You've got time, you see. You've got time. And then nothing happens there. Then the last step you can do is you can tip it on the tip of your tongue. The tip of the tongue picks up bitterness. If you pick up bitterness, avoid eating that plant, essentially. Um, and if you do get it in your mouth and it feels like it's a little bit tasty, eat a little bit, don't eat too much. Your body is not designed to eat too much of it. Um, and then another very good thing out here is to, to follow the, the animals. If a baboon or monkey is eating them, there's a good chance you're able to eat. 
but uh, don't just go and eat things that you see out in the bush. There's lots of red things out there. Red is often a very, very bad color. I know we know lots of fruits we love to eat back home. Oh, red, look how juicy. Red is often poisonous. So maybe avoid it or go through those stages of testing. And very importantly, only eat little bits of it because it might still make you sick because you aren't really designed to be eating it. But for starvation purposes, um, you might get through that eventually. So, hope that helps. Some nice tips for the wild. Okay, well, we're going to carry on here. We're going to head towards um, Twin Dams. And then go check out the Mawati, see if we can maybe pick up on any signs of Tundi. In the meantime, back over to the west, Swalu, Kalahari. Okay guys, so still not much happening on the cheetah front. Still very, very lazy. However, I do feel it's a patience game at the moment. You know, driving away that now, it is getting to that point in the afternoon where the shadows are drawing longer and longer. So, I feel like they're gonna get up soon. And with that being the case, you don't wanna be away for when that happens, so. We're gonna have to wait it out. They definitely, I mean, the, the heads just popped up just because there was bird flying, birds flying over them. So they're definitely keeping their ears open for any, any movement or any sound or any smell that might come their way. So with that being the case, I do feel like that if there is something moving our way that they're gonna be interested in it not the case at the moment. And with these two boys, you know, they're gonna they're gonna have to have to look to hunt today because with the with the clearing up now, they've got quite a big area to cover um, to remark their territory after all the rainy weather. That would not have happened just in a day's time. So with that being the case. Uh, I want to say they have at least still half of their territorial boundaries to remark, and then they, you'll want uh, they'll want to mark as well on the inner sections of the um, territory. So with that being the case, they've got quite a big job ahead of them. So it's time to fill up the tank and be ready to um, go when they need to. Daniel, very good question. Yes, they, a lot of other predators would actually attack the cheetahs while they sleep. Um, the largest enemy, I want to say, right throughout southern Africa or right throughout Africa will be the, the lions. Um, they are responsible for, are responsible for killing quite a bit of cheetah during a year. However, over here in this particular area where we're in right now, um, the spotted hyenas will definitely be a problem for them. They'll need to be careful of those guys. Um, also leopard will be something that they need to be wary of. And then, you know, not only predators, you know, if they come across a buffalo, a buffalo will recognize them as a predator. And with that being the case, they'll, if they get the chance, they'll want to eliminate a potential threat. So buffalo will go for them as well. Rhino might chase them around a little bit if you like places like uh, Pinda or so um, but out here predator wise if you have to think um, specific to Tswalu it's going to be places like, or things like the spotted hyenas, the lions leopards, those types of things even brown hyena uh, if it's one on one they'll definitely be able to um, overpower the cheetah and it, it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a kill um, it can also only be an injury like you know how powerful a hyena's bite is if they just get a hold of the arm or, or the leg or the foot or even the spine and they just quickly bite you'll find that they will injure that cheetah mortally and either die on site or within a week or so, you know, either from infection or not being able to hunt or anything like that. 
So with that being the case, yes, there are other predators, definitely, that would want to kill the cheetahs, especially while they sleep, because then they can um, sneak up on them. With this cheetah being so fast, they do need to get quite close to them, if not surprise them completely, uh, to be able to get a hold of them. Or corner them like in a in a mountains, you know, on the foot of a mountain or something like that. But yeah, uh, we'll have to, at the moment, luckily, there's not, not any predators around that we know of. You know, we might be wrong, there might be a leopard in a tree not too far away from here or so, but nothing that they need to worry about for the next, let's say, two hours until it gets dark, because that's when, when those big boys start moving around. So yeah, guys, we are going to stick with this flat cheetah for a while and send you over to a flat leopard in Juma, see if he doesn't want to wake up a little bit. Well, man, we're in the same boat at the moment, much like we were this morning. Um, Sabui is also very, very flat. She's kind of rolled in a funny way now, and it's, the visual is not that good. No sign of either of the cubs. I was hoping if we were just patient, um, they both would arrive, and then we'd kind of see her moving a little bit. And maybe that's why she was moving uh, earlier on, is because the cubs were around. Um, and she just wanted to get away from them in some peace and quiet and so she's found herself a nice spot where they won't bother her. So what I might do from here is actually just go back down the drainage, see if we can't find either of them and see if maybe they're in a slightly better spot that we can see them. Um, but I've been sitting here kind of thinking about her and the cubs and kind of what's going on with them and, and where they're going to be in the next few months. Uh, I, I suspect that we're going to start seeing her kind of pushing the cubs out, which is obviously going to mean that she's then going to start coming into Easter cycles again, um, which is going to be interesting to see which way she goes. Um, we've seen Mulawati is moving far north at the moment, um, and that's because I'm, I'm sure that he's getting the, the scent of Klalamba potentially particularly, but maybe even in Sele, um, up towards the northern side of Juma, Bifuzuk, um, as well as Shadulu in the west, because he's being seen around Arethusa too. But if I was Mulawati, I would not want to go too far, because Sabui is a prize catch, and so, you know, if I was a, a, a Mulawati leopard, I would kind of move my way down the side and just make sure that in the next few months I don't go too far, um, because otherwise you never know, maybe another little male sneaks in and sires the cubs with her. She's obviously a, a prime specimen, she's a beautiful leopard and um, in kind of prime of her life, which means that, you know, she's she's going to attract the attention of a multiple different individuals. Um, if she goes south into Mala Mala, it'd be interesting if she drags a male north. Um, we know that um, there's a few males kind of hanging around in this area with quarantine and Mulawati and you can never really write off Tingana, although I would be very surprised if he came down here. Um, you can't really write him off. And then, of course, even Hukumuri could make some random move and kind of find her. So um, Mulawati needs to sort of get um, a little bit further south again. Um, these cubs won't be with her for that much longer and then you're going to find a situation where um, he's going to have to be proactive about sort of finding her and then mating with her. Although she's she's also a cat that moves a lot. She goes up and towards Juma and I'm really going to be intrigued to see what happens with her and these cubs and where she leaves, um, particularly Langa. Um, and because of, of Langa and, and where she's kind of, as, as a female, where she's going to fit in in this complex system between Shadulu, Klalamba, Tandi and Kuchava, um, which I'll get into a little bit more now. But Zay, you're asking um, how do you know a leopard is territorial in an area? It's quite easy. Um, leopards that breed in an area, leopards that scent mark and vocalize are territorial creatures. So um, you'll find, I mean, not so much with the male breeding, because sometimes you can get an outlying situation. We've seen it with Mvula um, before, where he mated as a, as a nomadic old male. Um, and even Tingana, who, I mean, he's not really really nomadic nor is he fiercely territorial but he's mating every now and then within Sela at the moment so but with females if you're finding them having cubs um, you're generally finding them then scent marking um, as well as um, kind of calling and 
um, making sure other leopards aren't around and that's a good indication that they're territorial so scent marking really is the kind of definition for it but um, any sort of leopard that breeds in an area would also kind of qualify um, for that as well um, and that's why I was saying it's going to be super interesting to see what happens with Lunga because basically what you've got is let's say this is Sibui's kind of territory here this side of her is where Shidulu is this is Tlalamba, this is Tandi, this is Kuchava and they're tightly packed in this sort of periphery and so Sibui has now got to somehow carve a territory either south or north that allows space for Lunga to start her life um, ultimately with female leopards often what they'll do is they kind of carve off a section of their territory and sort of donate it to their daughters in order to start their lives and if you see with, with Tandi it's a prime example um, when she gave birth to Tlalamba it was central Juma and she used to roam pretty much that whole Juma Dam or Gari Dam area up a little bit towards the Bufuzuk boundary but now we don't see Tandi there at all Tandi has shifted way down to the southeast and she's left all of that area for Tlalamba so with her I'm wondering if she's not going to push further north again um, and go towards the southern parts of Juma where she's been taking the cubs or maybe she's going to leave Lunga that side but that would be quite dangerous for her because the further north she takes Lunga the more issues she's going to have with Tandi, Tlalamba um, and Shadulu particularly. Um, this side she's obviously going to have to try and defend a territory against Kuchava. Luckily for her though um, is that all the other females around here have had boys and so Lunga's not going to have nearly as much competition as what Shasha is going to have. Shasha is going to have an issue where he's going to have Tandi's cub, Kuchava's cub, uh, Mulawati, um, who knows where um, quarantine is at that stage. If Tingana is still around, Hukumuri, um, Tortoise Pan could potentially push in. Um, and then you've got male leopards from the north as well. We know there's that young male around Sydney's dam. We know that there's also uh, in Trangula. We know that there's even another male that was seen on the boundary the other day. Um, that's an unidentified male. And Motsuri too. So a lot of male leopards in this little section. And that's going to cause a lot of issues for the youngsters. They're going to all have to start distributing and kind of finding their way around. So it's going to be super interesting all right so i think we're going to bumble see if we can maybe find the other two in the meantime let's send you back across to steve love to come and join you shortly and everybody you're back with us we've decided to find our weavers and uh, we've just been given a call of something so i'm going to go and try and follow up on that quickly the lions we're headed to just caught in parlor so stick with us we can talk about the weavers again shortly what i'm quite surprised about is that i'm just going to talk in the radio quickly Cobbett, thanks Dunk. five minutes out there's is this only village, mainly village weavers there? Last year there was village southern masked and the lesser masked weaver. There was a lesser mask there, only one, but the rest are all village. So it looks like that's turned into the lesser masked, <laughs> it's turned into the village village. Sorry. Okay, so we're gonna just go real quickly, safely but quickly, to Torchwood. Hold on, everybody. Uh, see if we can catch up with the with uh, three lionesses. This morning we didn't have great signal in that area, but they've moved slightly. Uh, they've just caught it in parlor. So three lionesses. It could be quite graphic if we do get there in time. Um, so those of you who are watching or sensitive to this sort of thing, please just bear in mind that we do like to bring you wild coverage of things in the African wilderness and sometimes it can be a little bit hard to watch. Um, but I will warn you again if we do get there with regards to signal and with regards to what we're going to be seeing. Let's just bear that in mind. Lions, the circle of life, they do eat. There are many in pile around and it's all a balancing act in nature. feeling that tummy inside it's always something very very primal about predators on a kill doesn't matter how many times you see it it's uh, it's always quite something to behold just that raw energy that raw power and the life energy changing changing sides so if you're not into that sort of thing then um, when we get there just turn the volume down and maybe look away for a few minutes but we will warn you when the time comes 
Oh no, we've got an elephant roadblock. Elephants everywhere. Elephants, okay. They heard me. Come on, elephants, you want to move out of the way? We're not going to chase them, of course, but uh, they've decided that they want to move out the way anyway, which is great. Hello, big fellas, beautiful ladies and sons and daughters. We are indebted to your movement. Often is the case they would have stopped in the road and then we just would have waited. It's the way it works. They never want to push animals out the way, but they've moved on their own accord. So thank you, Mama, for your beauty and your kindness and allowing us through. freshness of this afternoon is really nice right now. The, the clouds have covered up. The rain doesn't seem to be approaching us at all. have been known to attack elephants. It's often at their detriment. Um, it's why elephants sort of behave like they do sometimes, especially with youngsters, because young elephants are at risk of lion. Obviously, it's, uh, there's much easier things to catch out there, but uh, lion are the one predator that are known to kill elephants. Not regularly, but um, it's why the, the youngsters don't ever go too far from mum. It's a little bit dangerous. And in, in parts of Africa and Botswana, a place called Savu, Savu, not Savu. Marcel, where's that place? Savuti. In Botswana, the elephant numbers are very high there. The prides of lion actually hunt elephant. They, uh, they sort of isolate sub-adults of the population and they actually bring them down. Prides, mega prides of 40, 50 lion. There was, a, there was a documentary on it years ago, the guys filming it in the dark in infrared, it was frightening. Because the elephants are just running and running and running and you're in a car, a car like this, with 40, 50 lions hungry at night. Woo! I don't know if I would, um, well my tummy would definitely be turning in knots. Okay, Steve from Wild Earth crossing into Torchard. We're in tortured, everybody. If you didn't understand that on the radio, it's important to communicate these things. Although there are no Juma guides out at the moment, so we still have to manage who's going in and out. Simone, I'm going, I'm going. I don't want to kill Marcel here at the back. And obviously there's a there's a certain speed with which you can travel. There's there's going quickly and there's there's being um, what's the word? Reckless. So Three lionesses on an impala. It's still going to be busy. Um, it's going to be noisy. Who knows? There's no real point in rushing too much. It's been about five minutes. Five minutes. They still be busy without us um, endangering ourselves or any wildlife along the way. And all these bumps. I'll be fine in these bumps, but Marcel will. Um, We'll end up at the lion sighting and I'll have to climb on the back and try frame the lions because I'll have lost the camera along the way. And an aerial. He's going to chat quickly. Uh, Duncan for Steve. From, from the dam, I'm just coming. Unfortunately, it sounds like we've lost Stephen Falconbridge for now. Hopefully, we'll be able to get him back just in a little bit. Well, my English is gone completely. I'm speaking gobbledygook this afternoon. I don't know what's happened to me. Um, English is, I don't know, sometimes you lose the ability to speak. But anyway, we've come to Chitra Dam just for a little bit. Um, there is a herd of impalas that is heading towards where Sibui is, and I'm hoping that maybe little cubs will pop out somewhere there. Um, in the meantime, though, there's this beautiful kind of view of the dam. You've got hippos, there's an elephant that's coming down, waterbuck, wildebeest, impala. Um, I'm sure there's a crocodile lurking somewhere as well. And then a beautiful kind of um, sun 
sets, but not really. It's the opposite of the sunset. It's light that is reflecting from where the sun is. On, but not really. It's the opposite of the sunset. It's light that is reflecting from where the sun is onto clouds uh, in the background, um, which is very, very pretty. And there's the odd male impala shouting as well. It's always very s kind of serene when you come um, to Chitwa Dam. I love spending time here. It's a little dam that always has got a surprise somewhere. So if you just sit here for long enough, you'll either get, um, you know, a random bird that arrives or you'll have, um, you know, something coming down to drink or there'll be an alarm call close by. So it's for me at this time of the day, especially, is one of the best places um, to spend time. I, I kind of like sitting here at this time of the day. It always, um, makes me feel like there's a possibility of something at any point. Now I was saying that there's hippos, but there's also an Ellie that's striding off in the distance. He's kind of walking away from us. I was hoping he was gonna come down to the water to drink or have a little swim given how humid it is. But I think he's already swam somewhere else because he's all kind of dark in coloration. Um, you can see him just sort of moving off in the background. Um, he's not even stopping under the marula trees. Normally at this time of the year when they're on this clearing, it's because they're looking for little marula fruits that have fallen. And there's quite a few marula fruits on the ground. Um, even though they're not hugely ripe or very developed, especially with the rain and the storms that we've been having and a little bit of wind, it often dislodges the number of marula fruits. And so I'm surprised that we're not seeing more big bull ellies sitting under the trees, kind of just feeding. It will obviously happen over the course of the next little bit. We'll start to see a lot more of them um, coming in and, and herds of ellies will become far kind of more sparse and you'll find that the, the big bulls will sort of take over and if the herds are here, they generally have a tough time because they're harassed by these big males that are in the area. It's crazy to think though that kind of four months ago, where those hippos are right now, um, was right at the edge of the dam, which is crazy. Now, lots of you saying such a beautiful dam, and because it's a beautiful dam, I'm actually going to stop um, irritating all of you with my voice and let you listen to the sounds because it is a nice dam for sounds. There's always calls and the hippos and various other things. It's kind of when you keep quiet like this that you want the hippos to start grunting and making their noise, but I actually haven't heard them the whole time we've been sitting with that leopard. I haven't heard them calling once. Super peaceful though, isn't it? It's such a kind of say, like, beautiful evening. Um, these clouds have added all kinds of drama to the sort of reflections and to the skyline. It's a nice place just to sit and kind of wind down the day, that's for sure. Also, thankfully, cooling down a little bit now. Um, I believe that poor Taylor, where she is, up in Pridelands and near Hoodsprate, got absolutely hammered with rain this afternoon. Um, there's flooding all over the place. Taylor's fine. Um, she sent me Vinnie a voice note kind of showing me all of the rain and describing it in great detail. But um, I've got lots of photos from all kinds of people of roads that are flooding. and So it must have really, really come down that side. Here we haven't had anything, and that's why the humidity is so high. Um, after that rainfall that's in the air, um, I reckon we must be easily at 90%, if not almost 100% humidity this afternoon. Makes me kind of jealous of those hippos, that's for sure. I wouldn't mind being in their shoes right now. That 
kind of just chilling in the water seems like the best place to be at this stage. All right, we'll kind of just bumble about a little bit and then we're gonna head back towards where Subui is, um, see if we can get some luck there. Um, hopefully she'll be up and about when we do return. Okay guys, so just have a look at the angle which we are looking at right now. You can actually see how flat that belly is of the cheetah, how it, you know, dives in there behind the ribcage. So that's the clear indication that we're hoping for that they're going to be looking to hunt this afternoon. It is visibly cooling down now or, or, you know, you can feel it quite easily. I mean, we are sitting in the shade, but the breeze is definitely picking up. The temperature is dropping, so hopefully soon we'll be able to get a little bit more activity from these guys. Um, because the most movement we've seen at the moment is the grass moving in the wind. So <laughs> we're really hopeful that this will be the case, um, that they will also start moving soon, which I'm, I'm pretty sure about. You know, it might not be right now, it might not be in the next 20 minutes, but it might, uh, it will be this afternoon. They are going to look to hunt. Uh, well, if I looked like them, I would definitely want to hunt this afternoon. So that's what I'm banking on. So yeah, hopefully soon they'll get up and get active and, you know, start looking to get something to eat. Cheetah hunts is not an often thing. I see the one just popped his head up. Um, so like you can see, quite regularly they're doing that just to, you know, keep an eye open for whatever's happening. They are looking into the direction where the wind is coming from, so they might also be smelling something. But you can see those eyes are still very sleepy. So I think maybe another 20 minutes or so, and they'll start getting... Welcome back to Anbion Pinda, everybody. We've left those open grasslands where we were with those buffalo and rhino. Um, it is getting very windy um, out in those open areas, so we decided to, to leave them, and it seems like the storm is starting to roll into Anbion Pinda. Um, we've come into a section of the reserve that's very good for, for leopard. Um, there's a female in particular that's very relaxed. We often see her. Um, I actually saw her last night. Um, so we're driving around the, the area where we last saw her um, yesterday evening, um, just seeing if we can find any tracks or signs of her. Um, we were sitting at a, a little water hole, just listening out for any alarm calls that could potentially give her position away. Um, things like these impalas that we, we're sitting with at the moment, nyalas. It's quite a dense drainage line around us. Um, we haven't had any luck at the moment, but we, we're going to continue though um, around this area, seeing what we can find. Hopefully we, we strike gold and can find that female leopard for everybody watching. But these impalas, they seem very relaxed. You can see a lot of them are browsing. One's even going to the bathroom there. And they, they're feeding off the grass, as well as some of these little trees around. We're gonna send you off quickly to Tristan. Well, it seems as though everybody's being fairly feisty. Just now we had male impalas chasing male impalas. There's been a male waterbuck chasing a female. And now this big bull elephant is chasing another bull elephant. Unfortunately, the other bull screamed across this open area at about 70,000 miles an hour and has disappeared in a blur of flapping trunks and ears and kind of just generally looking very, very kind of upset about the fact that he's being pursued. Um, you can see this one has got trunk up and is just kind of walking with a lot of attitude, that's for sure. Um, but I, <laughs> I don't expect uh, that that other one will stop anytime soon and I also don't expect that this 
elephant will stop chasing him for a while still. We're going to see a lot of this over the next little bit. As all these bull elephants come through, lots of them are going to be in mass, which is going to mean that we're going to find a lot of temperamental, um, busy uh, male elephants that are going to chase each other, females, all kinds of other things. In fact, this time last year, we were seeing males trying to mate with almost every female. In fact, we got mating on camera twice, which was pretty crazy to see. So. I think we're going to be ready for a repeat performance. Um, as our elephant kind of disappears into the vegetation, you can see he's crossing the road exactly where the other one disappeared. And um, we've got some guinea fowl that have just arrived now. They're coming down to have a little drink. Little egrets have just flown over. I haven't seen those guys in a while at Chitwa. Nice to see them. I'm a bit disappointed, I must be honest, about the bird life this afternoon. I, I've been scanning around. And I don't even see any sandpipers on the edge of the dam. There's no kind of movement. I would have thought we would have had green bacterians, sandpipers, um, or on the fringes. Even sometimes at this time of the year, you get different gull species that come in, um, open-billed storks. So I was kind of hoping for both of those, but alas, um, no sign of any of them. Just lots of different animals that are running around. Beautiful evening though. Oh. You might hear a car coming there, coming down to the dam just like we are. Um, I'm going to try and see if they can spot anything. I'm, I'm sure they want to try and see if they can get that leopard, but really the view of Sibri is so bad for most vehicles that they won't really get too much of a sighting from it. Our vehicles are pretty much the only ones that can get there. Okay, well, we're going to carry on. Let's see what else we can find. Hopefully, Sabui is going to get up and going fairly shortly. Welcome back, everybody. So we're still sitting here with these impalas just grazing in this open area. And far off in the distance, it seems like there, there is a bit of rain starting to, to head our way. You can start to, to feel the, the cool breeze, also that lovely smell of the, when you can smell the rain coming. It is a, a beautiful smell. We are hoping for quite a lot of rain. The, the reserve is very dry at the moment. I'm sure a lot of the animals will be very grateful for a bit of rain. But so far we, we have had no luck with the, the leopard tracks as of yet we we will still be continuing um, in this area seeing if we can't find any fresh tracks or signs of this female leopard i can see some of the impalas just looking off into the distance not too sure what they've spotted but if these impalas do manage to spot a predator such as a leopard they'll make an alarm call just to alert all members of the herd as well as other animals in this area that there's a potential threat around and they must just um, keep a lookout around and it's it's actually quite a, an amazing sound um, to hear the impalas making a noise um, and all different antelope have unique alarm calls um, a kudu has quite a, a loud bark I'm um, often here, it's in the, the mountains on Pinda, maybe leopards moving around. I did hear earlier on that there was a, a male leopard found, um, not too far from where we are now, but it was in a very mountainous -y and rocky area. We were actually on our way there, but the, they lost sight of that leopard, and it's quite a dense area, so I don't think it will be worthwhile heading back into that area to try and see if we can find it. Kylie, thank you, thank you so much for your question. Um, impalas, they are pretty defenseless um, animals, um, particularly with predators and things. I mean, you can imagine if a leopard comes and, and tries to catch one of these impalas or does catch an impala, those other impalas in the area, all they're gonna wanna do is try and scatter and get away from the, the threats, which would be the leopard. Um, 
I know it is lambing season, so there are quite a, a lot of youngster, uh, youngsters around, young and parlor lambs. Uh, Moms can be quite quite defensive, but they they won't come back to potentially try and chase off the the leopard off the the impala. She'll most likely stay in the area. It's quite sad, but she'll often stay in the area and try and contact call. Um, They've got a a contact call that they do to try and call their youngster. And she'll do that for maybe an hour or so, and then she'll, she'll move away from the area. So they're not defensive um, animals, Kali. With this breeze around, I can see the the impalas, they're feeding a little bit. As the breeze picks up, they just pick their head up a little bit, have a look around, see that there's nothing around. You can see one of the the, the impala lambs, Glenn. Excuse me, I saw it just looking into the, the bush over here. I wonder if it didn't see something maybe moving around, just making sure what it is. But this weather here on Anmyon Pinda is, is much needed. The, the last couple of days have been scorching temperatures. I think yesterday it was around 36 degrees Celsius. And I mean with the humidity here where we are, not too far from the the Indian Ocean, um, it's very, very humid on and beyond Pinda. It's a beautiful scenery we've got here. I don't know if Glenn can maybe just scan the, the horizon. It's a beautiful view that we've got of Pinda, the southern parts of Pinda. On a, on a very cool, sorry, on a very clear afternoon, you can actually see right off in the distance the coastal sand dunes of the Indian Ocean. And it's about from where we are now, plus minus 25 to 30 kilometers away from where we are. We, we're quite grateful on Pinda that if we do have a day off or two, we can make that trip to the nearest beach, which is Sudwana Bay not too far away from here. So you've got you got the bush, you got the best of both worlds, bush and the beach. It's a, a plus for Pinda. You can see some of these impalas getting a little bit closer to us. So I think we're gonna leave these impalas. We're gonna continue on our leopard search We're going to send you over to Steve. Let's go see what he's got for you. Thanks, Chad. Good luck with your leopard search. We um, unfortunately didn't have too much luck with the lions. We found them, but uh, we just couldn't obviously bring them to you. So they'd finished most of the kill by the time we got there. Still a little bit of noise and growling. And unfortunately, we're very low down in the depression, so we weren't able to bring you. But we are going to be able to show you a wonderful afternoon sky. One of my favorite times of year, the summer months, because of the angle that the sun is hitting the earth at, creates a lot more heat, a lot more evaporation, and a lot of friction and electricity in the air, which causes lots of evaporation and currents, leads to lightning storms, and that's what leads to the summer months being rainy, lightning stormy, because of the heat generated from the sun. So I'm going to just allow you all a few moments to just revel in the beauty that is the sunset, and maybe contemplate your day maybe contemplate some thoughts going forward into this year, 2021. Any big achievements you have set forward or anything you'd like to get done. Anything you'd like to forget about as well.
very serene and very peaceful, everybody. Hmm, all right, beautiful sunset. Sun's sunk a little bit lower than we'd have hoped to. Beautiful nonetheless to see this wonderful sky. It's amazing how much further to the south the sun is setting at the moment. Last time I framed up a sunset, a lot more open space over here. It's amazing how it moves, and it's how the angle of the sun changes on the earth leading to our summer and winter seasons in the north and the southern hemisphere we're going to spend another moment here taking this all in send you over to Tualu with this sleeping cheetah all right you guys so this one male that one that's in in the screen right now. He's getting a little restless. I think he's gonna wanna start getting up soon. He's constantly looking up and moving around and you know, changing his lying position and so on. So I'm hoping that that is the case. Um, there was a group of Springbok that just ran across the, the clearing behind us. Um, unfortunately, towards where the wind is blowing from the cheetahs, so not making their chances better to get close. However, it might have drawn their attention and they will keep that in mind for when it, you know, when the sun starts setting properly. Um, there's also some oryx coming into the waterhole and so on. So the opportunities is starting to present itself. There's a, every now and again here, a troop of baboons also are coming closer and closer to the water. They won't go for the baboons though, <clears throat> or I haven't seen them doing that, but they're going to risk too much to go for the baboons. Those baboons are rather large troops that we have here in Tualu. So a lot of big males, which will be able to defend the troop. So I don't think the cheetahs will take a chance with them. But yeah, you can see he's constantly looking around, scanning. I think they that he's gonna <clears throat> pretty soon start telling his brother, no, it's time to get up now. You can see how he shook his head there to the back as well. I think he might have, might have picked something going up. Roshi, um, you know, with us as guides, we get the, the training to to know what to look for and when, you, when you spend enough time in the bush you know what to look for when it comes to the predators even the larger herbivores you know the things that i worry about more would be rather something like a big elephant coming towards the vehicle than a lion or a leopard or a cheetah um, there is the possibility always but you need to be able to um, see their behavior and make sure that when they show you that they're not in the mood for you being close to them um, give them some space you know and there's quite a couple of things that you'll be able to look for um, things like them pulling their ears flat when you approach <coughs> um, starting to flick their tail sideways up and down is a big no-no if you see the lions flicking their tails up and down you need to know that they're very angry with you but sideways typically shows you a little bit of aggression or un uh, discomfort they'll also go and lie down in the stalking position and stare at you um, those types of things are all signs that you need to to look at. I mean, obviously, if you miss those signs and you go a little too close, they're going to give you a growl as well, or they'll get up and they'll move away initially. And if you then don't listen to the warnings, um, they'll become a bit more aggressive to ch try and scare you off. Uh, I've never, I've been very lucky, I've never had a case where um, the animal looked like she wanted, he or she wanted to climb into the car with me. Um, but then again, also, you know, the, the predators they grow up 
having the vehicles around them and they grow up not seeing it as a food source. So it's only really when they're not in the mood for company when they'll show a little sign of aggression. Um, so with that being the case, you'll, you'll much rather have something like a black rhino or an elephant or those types of things out in the bush that turns aggressive towards you. Elephant's probably the most likely one. And so that's also something that you need to keep an eye, keep an eye on. Um, talking about elephants, guys, uh, we're going to send you off to Tristan. That's got some elephants at the moment. They are very relaxed, though. Well, we've managed to catch up with our two Ellies. Unfortunately, we went back to where we left Sabuya and she's gone, which is typical. It always happens when you do that. Um, I should have known better. Um, but we'll keep scratching around for her. But I, I just kind of bumped into these two Ellies. Um, unfortunately, Langa has gone west into Little Gauri, so we missed her. But you can see <laughs> the male on the left is the bigger of the two, and he's bullying the one on the right, which is the one that was running earlier away uh, unfortunately he's not going to get too many marulas because every time he tries to get close that other male kind of lunges at him uh, and makes him sort of move out the way they they're not that different in terms of body size the one at the back's got slightly bigger tusks and i think just has more attitude in general which goes a long way in the natural world I and mean, you've got a a lot more sort of sternness about you that can often keep the younger individuals at bay I just want to see if he potentially, I mean, he's picking up marulas for sure, but I want to see if maybe he's going to push the tree. Um, often what you'll find is if they find marulas at a tree, they know that there's more in the tree itself. And so they kind of go up to the tree and they headbutt it and almost hit it so that it shakes. And that causes all these marulas to start dropping onto the ground um, and, and then far more accessible for them. Let's see if he does it. If he continues to find, then he won't. Maybe he's going to reach up, rather. This is cool, look. <laughs> you can even see the teeth in his mouth, which is amazing. Isn't it incredible the power, one, and two, the reach that these guys have got? And that is seriously high up there. And he's managed just to kind of break it with effortless ease um, using the weight of that head. And Don't feed much on the leaves. Um, it's really the fruit that he's after. So it's a pretty ridiculous thing that he's ended up doing. Silly boy. Amazing to watch. Now here in South Africa, we don't see it very much at all where they go up onto their back legs to do that. But if you go into the low Zambezi um, National Park and Minor Pools National Park along the Zambezi River on the border of Zimbabwe and Zambia. And if you saw the flash of lightning in the background too, there's some thunder in the distance. Hopefully it stays away. But there they feed off anna trees. And when the anna trees have got pods, these guys can't help themselves. It's like a kid in a candy store. And you find that they go onto their back legs and they kind of stand on two feet with this trunk straight up to reach those pods. It's the most incredible thing to see. And there's one elephant in particular in minor pools that's quite famous for it named Boswell. Um, and he does it pretty much um, every time they start to see it. He's kind of on his back legs. And it's a very sought after photograph from a number of photographers, particularly because the light in those um, areas is so beautiful. Uh, a lot of people go to minor pools and, and low Zambezi just to get those elephants in those anna tree forests um, on their back legs and feeding. Can you hear the low grumbles of thunder? It is looking awfully ominous. Not good. Now I'm poor, I'm poor on camera as well. And I'm poor asking a question, how many teeth do elephants have? I'm poor, I'm going to show you right now. So I have a book that has a very, very nice um, diagram for uh, elephant teeth. So if you give me two, se uh, two seconds. But essentially, they don't have as many teeth as you would think. Um, they have very large teeth, um, but not like what we do, you know, uh, most animals have a lot of teeth 
um, whereas these guys don't. Um, just give me two seconds. I'm just trying to find the dental structure for them. For them. Where is it? Oh, I know I had it here somewhere. Sorry, there we go. All right. So, if we have a look here, we have the dentition of most animals. Uh, it's a really nice kind of outlay of this. I'm sorry if there's a bit of shine, I'll try and angle the book. It's just that it's getting quite dark now, so we're using the light a little bit. But here's our Ellie over here. You can see that it's only got two sets of teeth, top and bottom, in the mouth itself. Um, so you've got the premolars and molars, and then you've got actually another two sets of teeth, which is the tusks, or one set of teeth, should I say, um, coming down. So these are the yellow kind of incisors, modified incisors that are tusks, and then the, the two teeth on the bottom jaw, two teeth on the top jaw. Now what actually happens with these is they're basically on a train track. The rest of the teeth sit back in the jaw and they come down. As these start to wear, they push forward and they fall out and then the next set comes through. And they'll have six sets of teeth through their lifespan. Um, once that sixth set is gone, that's the end of it. Um, unfortunately, they then start to starve, um, which is not an ideal thing, but it is the way um, life goes. On. Otherwise, they would live a lot longer, but that's basically their dental kind of work. Um, you can see a number of other animals which we can get into, but um, very cool kind of book to have for all of those kinds of things. A number of you have actually asked me um, about that book. So you'll have to, uh, I'll post it somewhere and then you'll be able to kind of pick it up yourself. But it's a really nice book for those kind of things. I'm a little bit worried, to be honest, about being on Chitwit because the thunder and lightning behind us and to our west is getting quite severe. Um, and obviously lightning is the problem, not so much the thunder. So I might just start getting a little bit closer to home just in case it does start to storm so we don't damage anything. In the meantime, let's send you across to Steve. <laughs> Tristan, likewise, we saw and heard that thunder and lightning while we were doing our last segment, and uh, we've also decided to come home. And then there was some huge rolling lightning, or should I say rolling thunder? That's the right term, isn't it? We could hear it, or we saw it, and then we counted and counted, and what is it, one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, and I got to 20, and I still didn't hear it, so... Apparently that's how you gauge how far away the actual storm is. And then what happens again, you count it and you can tell how quickly it's moving towards you. But uh, yeah, a lightning, unfortunately everybody in these vehicles is a very big, uh, big challenge. So it's important for us to be a little bit closer to home if we do have a big lightning storm. potentially dangerous not just to the equipment but to us <laughs> stuck in bed wants to know the coolest elephant sighting well the first one that comes to mind i've got so many stuck in bed i've got so many um many of them on foot but i'll probably talk about the one uh, that was on a vehicle with a big elephant by the name of george who used to occur in the singita property in the kruger years ago and it was something, quite something. We were in this open area. There was nothing around us. No trees, open grass, little pebbles on the ground. And there was this big old elephant bull. He was so old. Both his tusks were broken off. He was just, his skin was all wrinkly. And he had this young elephant bull hanging out with him. And uh, George was very cool. Even on foot, he was very cool. And uh, so this one day, this young elephant bull was in the open area. He was behaving all sort of strangely with us. Like, what's this vehicle? What's this vehicle? And so George looked at him and he said, watch this. And he walked up straight up to the front of the car. He picked up some pebbles on the ground and he threw them into the car onto me and the guests. Oh, I'll carry on with that. Let's send you back to Pinda. Welcome back everybody. So we've been looking for a leopard, but we came across a quite a small African rock python. Sorry, southern African rock python. You can see how it's just lying in the road there. Hasn't moved at all since we came around the corner. How beautiful are those patterns on it? And I 
think what this African, with what this rock python is doing is lying on the road, trying to absorb as much of the, the heat as possible. You can imagine, I mean, I've been speaking about how hot it was here on Pinda um, throughout the day up until probably about three o'clock or so. And with the sun hitting the, the road, it's very, very hot. And this snake is going to use that heat to get energy and potentially maybe start moving around, maybe going to, to look for any hunting opportunities. And I mean, a, a snake like this might look for any birds, um, maybe even feed on eggs, little insects. It is quite a small African rock python. I know it is quite large, I'd say. What do you reckon, Glenn? Mm, a meter and a bit. Oh, so maybe a meter, just over a meter. Um, rock pythons can get up to maybe five meters, five, six meters. I mean, that's triple the length of this one, which is quite massive. Um, the biggest one I've ever seen is probably three and a half meters or so on Pinda. Wasn't too far from where we are at the moment, actually. But it's beautiful how it's just lifting its head there, right on the road for us. I'm sure there's a, a couple of snake fans out there that are very excited at the moment. Myself in particular, I do enjoy snakes, looking at snakes. Penelope, I'm very happy that you're so excited. Uh, you can ask Glenn, I was very excited when I came around the corner. It actually gave me a bit of a fright. I thought at first it might have been maybe a, a log in the road or a stick, but then I had a second look and I was like, wow, a snake. So I'm just as excited as you are with this python. It almost, it hasn't even moved at all since we've been here. But I can definitely see that it is it's still alive. I can see it's got its head up. Now, I'm glad we, we stopped when we did because if we were driving a little bit faster, I don't know if we would have seen it. It might have scared it off the road. There is still quite a, a cool breeze blowing here on Pinda. The clouds are still rolling in. I think this evening we, we're going to have a, a bit of a downpour, which a lot of the, the animals will be very, very happy for. This snake, I think most likely will probably start to move off. Leslie, very good question. What would this snake feed on? So I would say that this snake would feed on small rodents, um, maybe rats, mice. Um, I would say some big insects, um, maybe even something like a scrub hare, um, maybe a small scrub hare. Um, but that's most likely what it will feed off, maybe even birds. Um, pythons in particular, they're not too fussy and so they'll take sort of any opportunity that they can get. And often what pythons do is that they'll they ambush predators, so they're not the fastest of snakes. What they'll do is they'll often curl up maybe around a, a bush, hide themselves, camouflage themselves around that bush, and wait. And, I mean, they can wait for, for a very long time um, before they do eventually get an opportunity to hunt. And uh, it's a patience game out here. Maybe even what it will do is find a bush quite close to what we call a game trail. So a game trail is a <clears throat> excuse me, a path that is uh, carved in the bush by the animals moving around, often towards water. So where we are now, just past the snake, maybe 150, 200 meters away, is quite a prominent water hole in this area. So you can imagine a lot of animals moving um, around here. There's quite a lot of long grass around. So there must be quite a lot of um, prey around this area for this African python. So 
We're going to stay here with this python, see if it does move off. We're going to send you over to Steve with some elephants. Well done, Chad. Pythons. I haven't seen a python in ages. So you're back with us here on Droom, everybody. We were talking about elephants before, and uh, we've caught up with a small little herd here right next to the road, so I can continue my tale. So... <laughs> What I was saying before was that George basically said to the young elephant, he walked right up in front of us, picked up some pebbles. They weren't dangerous pebbles, everybody, just like the size of dice. And he just threw them into the car and it made that click, 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 clattering sound as the pebbles struck all the metallic objects and the chairs and the people. And then he turned sideways and walked past us very close, almost saying, see, these people are nothing. And the young elephant walked behind him with a big strut going, you see, I see you nothing. <laughs> George just showed you who you are. That was such a magical sort of understanding of how older elephants teach the young elephants of how to fit in and about how things work and all of that. But to be honest, I've got so many tales of elephants in my life, of elephants coming right up to the car, sniffing my face, elephant bulls on foot in fever tree forests up in the Pafuri, northern Kruger region. Elephants are They're very sacred, sacred to me, beautiful animals. I love spending time with them. They're always busy, you see, always busy. Even when they're sleeping, they're still busy because they don't sort of sleep silently. They're making noises and adults are standing nearby and they're moving a little bit. And it's actually quite beautiful to be in the presence of sleeping elephants. Uh, last year, about this time, I think it was, we were in the, the riverbed north of camp around Gary Cutline, the whole breeding herd of elephants, the adults were standing fast asleep and the youngsters were flat on the ground. Must have been about seven or so elephants sleeping on the floor. And we just spent about 45 minutes, an hour with them there, which was quite something, maybe less than that, but we got transported to another time. It's not like when you see lions sleeping, it's just flat, no movement. Elephants are moving, their ears are flapping. They're swaying a little bit from side to side. There's some deep, heavy breathing. Someone's always a little bit more alert and maybe a bit, a bit of movement happening. And then there's also the smell, which we're smelling right now. Sort of a sweet composty smell, sweet earthy smell. Caleb, there's only one species of elephant in South Africa. Uh, the African elephant is the, the main elephant on the African continent. There's the Indian elephant as well, and then forest or pygmy elephant. I don't know what the species is of that one. Slightly changed, living in the forests, a little bit smaller, but no doubt quite just slightly differentiated from the African, but Loxodonta africana, the largest. And they are very, very special. So many of them around. I think this might be part of the herd we saw earlier. We're slowly making our way back to camp so that we just within shooting distance if the storm decides to break. The lightning seems to be coming from all different directions now. It's hard to actually tell what's going on, but that's what I spoke about earlier, the orographic rain. The rain can fall all over the place. Don't necessarily get this huge blanket effect. Okay, we're gonna need to go into infrared in a moment as the light is starting to drop quite considerably. For the month of January 2021, we are offering a chance to win a unique Wild Earth expedition to the magnificent Swalu Kalahari. 
from the ancient Kortai's Karanaberg Mountains to the southern Kalahari's red sand dunes, Tuvalu offers what travelers crave most, space and time. The winner will explore this landscape in a vehicle, on foot or on horseback with a chance to go behind the scenes with Wild Earth and of course meet the meerkats. The prize includes a three-night stay for you and a friend at the luxury Mozi Lodge including flights from either Johannesburg or Cape Town. Open to all Wild Earth explorers who have signed up before the end of January 2021. Terms and conditions apply. If you love to watch Wild Earth, then we are inviting you to join our Explorers program. For a monthly subscription, you will have the opportunity to win fantastic Wild Earth expeditions, join our guides for a chat around the fire, receive weekly highlights from our shows and much more. All the money will go to keeping these live safaris on air, which in turn allows us to escape into nature every single day. The new year has arrived, and with it comes all kinds of other new beginnings. From hyena cubs to meerkat pups, the bush is full of new life. If you want to find out more, then sign up to be an explorer and join our New Beginnings Fireside Chat. Tristan and Steve will be looking at what's new here in the wilderness as we enter 2021. Join them on the 17th of January, straight after the Sunset Safari. There we go, guys. So, a little bit more activity. The baboons are going crazy here behind us. Um, not at the moment, but they were just now, so that definitely got the attention of the cheetahs. Um, both of them were up for a short while, but I do feel like they're starting to wake up. We're starting to see some yawns coming here and there and quite a bit more movement than what we've seen throughout the day or throughout the afternoon. So hopefully soon they're going to start moving. It is now cooling down very nicely, so I think they might just be waiting for the sun to dip a little lower before they start moving or maybe potentially something coming into this area or so um, there's some oryx and so on that's around but possibly a little too large for them so we'll have to see but they do seem not too much in the mood to start getting active soon today there's the one boy up again Craig, so you'll find they don't necessarily sleep as long, um, but they'll be inactive. It's just like lions. They're not, they don't physically sleep for 20 hours a day, but they are inactive for 20 hours a day. Um, so physical sleep, I'd say probably around, for a cheetah, probably around anything between 8 and 12 hours but they'll be inactive anything between 16 and 18 hours uh, sometimes even a little longer sometimes even up to 20 hours a day as well but then you know some of those hours might be spent just chilling under a tree having a look at their territory or cleaning themselves or doing something like that you know not physically moving necessarily um, but still conserving energy you know if, if, if that makes sense um, not walking around or actively hunting or going towards a waterhole or those types of things so just lying down either cleaning themselves or just resting you know with their eyes still open or so anything between 16 and 18 hours a day but physical sleep i'd say more like eight to 12 hours um, so it is quite a long sleep still as you can imagine when they're not hunting or when they're not um, doing something constructive with their energy they need to be as inactive as possible and there's no better way to do that than by sleeping but like we've spoken about earlier as well it's never it's not, not going to be a deep sleep because they always have to 
keep an ear open or an eye open for potential threats coming their way. So, yeah, more inactive than physically sleeping um, in that time that they say that they, you know, don't move much, but still very much aware of their surroundings. So like now, I can guarantee you, even though their eyes are closed, those radars on the top of their heads, the, the ears are working overtime and the nostrils are also working overtime to detect any strange sound or smell, which might potentially be prey or enemy, you know. So... Quite a bit of inactivity during the day, as you can imagine. But that's just because they don't know when their next meal will be, so they need to save as much as possible when they're not trying to obtain a meal or marking their territories or those types of things. However, I am getting in the mood for them to get a little bit more active. So yeah, guys, well, as soon as they do get active, which I don't think will be long from now, we'll come back here, but for the meantime, we're going to go back to Steve, okay? The wind has picked up and the lightning and rain is coming from behind us and from our left hand side. So we find ourselves in the middle of it. So we're not far. We're going to get up onto quarantine and then see. Well, obviously, we might find something along the way, but the lightning is getting closer. So just for safety's sake, be a little bit closer to camp in case. And uh, this is when I wish. Ooh. Again, on the left. Some zebra were here earlier. No doubt that Tristan has got a very similar sort of idea. You can probably hear the wind now. the most memorable lion kill for me it was probably a, a giraffe that was killed by the mountain pride of Sagita uh, due to the noise and the activity 20 lions killed a, a young giraffe hello everybody sorry the storm is coming oh oh you want to turn it that way? Oh, you guys wanted to frame that, I'm guessing. Okay, well, we'll let Tristan do this storm here, and we'll carry on into quarantine, and hopefully we'll all stay safe. Because uh, when the weather's like this, you want to get out of it. There's no escaping the lightning. Cheers. And uh, so the Mountain Pride managed to segregate. Segregate? That's the right word. Isolate a young giraffe. Probably about 10 years old, it was hard to tell really. Managed to get it away from mum. Um, the young youngsters, oh my word. Okay, now that is, that lightning is, is very close. You can't hear it now, so it's obviously not as close as we think, but it's getting very, very bright. They managed to um, get the youngster away from the mum. Um, some of them carried on after the mum, and the mum gave everything she could. So eventually uh, she had to give up. And then, sadly, they managed to take the young giraffe down. It was, uh, it was quite memorable, I think, because I had a New York family with me that two nights before we'd seen a pride of lions kill or a lioness kill a baby wildebeest and she brought it to her cubs, nine cubs and uh, she wanted the cubs to, to eat it and break it open and they didn't so she broke it open and the bloodlust kicked in and she started smacking the clubs, cubs all over the place and it just became that sort of that violence that you see in lion prides but it wasn't violent because it was the cubs and uh, so I had the same guests two nights later when we had a pride of lions kill a giraffe and then it was very memorable for them because at one point 
on a very moonless night. I asked him if they were all all right. They said, yes, we're fine. We're doing okay now. They'd all shifted to the side of the car. And uh, <laughs> and I said, okay, and we switched the lights off. <laughs> the noises were quite something. Um, but they had a good time. They had a good time. So I remember that one. That's what comes to my mind first. Uh, but there are so many as well. I once saw two male lions kill a baby impala, or a young impala, pull it out of the mud. One lion jumped into the mud that the impala was stuck in, pull it out, and then the two lion, lion males stood together and pulled, and they ripped the impala in half. I don't think there was much pain felt. It sort of happened quite quickly, but nonetheless quite traumatic. Okay, well, we're gonna send you over to the storm gazers so they can show you the lightning as it's building up in the distance. Well, sounds awfully macabre, Stephen. Um, but yes, generally when lions hunt, it is macabre. Now, it might look like a dark picture, but there's a very good reason for this because we wanted to show you the lightning that is coming from the south. There's also lightning coming from the west and the north, so we're being like, kind of converged on by three different storms at the moment. Um, the wind is getting up and the rain is starting to fall now as well, so it's about to become quite chaotic out here. I'm going to let you listen to the thunder. I'm going to keep quiet for a little bit. Of course, there's no thunder. I must admit, as much as it's not comfortable to be in an open vehicle, there is something absolutely surreal about sitting in the wilderness of Africa with a thunderstorm like this between the the lightning and the clouds and the, the wind it's it's a mesmerizing show in many respects um it is absolutely a sort of absolute masterclass by um nature in in power and and how much power it can actually harness um, i always thoroughly enjoy thunderstorms but generally like i say not sitting in open cars the storm that i'm worried about is not this one that we're watching um off to the south this with the way the wind is blowing is pushing away from us all the time there's the one that's behind us that is creeping up very quickly um and is starting to to get quite nasty um i'm just counting the kind of thunder after the strikes and it's still far enough that we don't have to worry normally when you hear us or see a bolt and then you hear the thunder straight away then you know it's kind of on top of you and it's time to then seek shelter at the moment it's okay um it's far enough that we don't need to stress too much well i mean for now <laughs> i reckon it's going to change within the next five minutes the way the wind has come up haunting though isn't it when the darkness and all of a sudden it's illuminated by this flash of light Holly, they can be. Um, the storms can be very violent um, along the, this area, um, particularly um, up on the escarpment. You get a lot of granite, um, which attracts lightning. Um, you find that you get huge electrical storms that come rolling off of that escarpment. Um, it's a, a horrible, horrible kind of thing when you get those rough hailstorms mixed with lightning. It's it's not nice. Um, but the storms can be savage. They can can cause a huge amount of damage. In fact, a lot of the farmers that are on the edges of these reserves, uh, as you go towards the escarpment in the Drakensberg Mountains, they all have insurance um, for weather um, or storm insurance to try and kind of cover the damage that can happen to their crops, particularly um, avocados, citrus, um, lychees, those kinds of things that as soon as you get really heavy um, wind and, and hail, that really damages the fruit tomatoes as well. Um, so yeah, the storms here can be quite violent. Um, we're lucky that we don't get really things like tornadoes or 
very seldom will we get any cyclonic activity here normally because it hits ground dissipates before it hits us so Mozambique feels that a lot more um, but the electrical storms can be can be quite nasty um, there's something that you need to be respected and it's why Steve and I are both much closer to camp um, it's not the rain side of things and it's not about getting wet it's about being in a car that is open with lightning striking all around it's it's an uncomfortable thing to be sitting in a in a lightning storm um, exposed it, it just while it probably wouldn't do anything to you given that you have rubber tires you just never know it, it just feels like a, a kind of accident waiting to happen and so that's why we're more nervous of the lightning than anything else and it's why we kind of retreating back closer to camp in order to just make sure that we keep everybody safe. Um, our vehicles do have little warthog tail antennas um, which will attract um, a fair amount of lightning. All right, talking about lightning and talking about moody conditions, it sounds like Steve has got an animal um, in these conditions and so let's jump across to him. Thanks Tristan, well indeed storm damage People pay a lot of money for insurance for that. It's difficult to insure your crops against elephants, though. <laughs> oh, you can see the lightning off the back of that elephant a moment ago. This elephant bull is not too concerned with the lightning. Actually, they quite enjoy the rain. Helps to cool things down. But it's that sort of tentative moment where you, you just know that the storm is coming in from three different directions, all of them closing in. So you don't want to be too far away. Obviously, we've always got measures for the rainfall, but when it comes to lightning, it's a bit tricky. And off the elephant goes. He's heading towards Gallagher Pan, maybe. He go and have himself a drink. He's been feeding on the marula tree uh, that we stopped earlier in the drive with that herd of elephants. He obviously arrived here to try find some of the marulas that that herd gobbled up and in the process he's actually done the tree a little bit of damage broken down some of the branches you'll see that these branches on the floor here are elephant damage not storm damage and there were plenty of fruits on the floor before now there's only a couple they're falling in the wind. You can actually hear them dropping. <laughs> Zandy, the Iolite looks eerie in the, for the most part normally, and when the lightning is lighting up the sky around as well it adds something to it as well doesn't it actually you can actually smell the rain now it's wonderful it's gonna be a lovely cool evening i love sleeping in stormy weather like this brought up in johannesburg we used to have stormy skies and nights like this in the summer which used to be beautiful I know a few of my friends from the UK who don't really experience weather like this, bless you myself, really, really struggled on Johannesburg evenings or nights when the lightning was just crashing down and the thunder was reverberating in the houses and the hail falling through the windows. I know my dad's watching right now. He will always tell a story of the golf ball sized or the tennis ball sized hail falling through the window, breaking the glass. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very long time ago. I find it quite pleasing. Obviously, not the shattery of glass, but the sounds of thunder and the rain on the roof and the change in the atmosphere, the cooling, and the wind that cools everything down.
we might have overcast conditions in the morning or it might burn off quite quickly. Okay, well, we're just going to keep watching this storm very closely as it closes in on us. Steve, I think we're all watching the storm pretty closely. Uh, it's an amazing thing just to kind of see it coming and the rain is starting to fall now. You can actually smell the rain coming, which is a pretty cool thing. But I'm gonna just let you guys listen to the sounds of the storm. Yeah, the wind has picked up completely now and like I say, you can start to feel the rain and smell it. So it's going to be on us pretty soon, but amazing to just kind of see the light show. I know it's dark for most of it, but um, the lightning is all around us. It's really, really pretty actually, just kind of looking out in every direction. Unfortunately, it's not the best lightning because it's not kind of visible. It's all sort of in the clouds. It's nice when you start to get those ones that fork down. That's always the most impressive. Anyway, we're going to probably try and seek some sort of refuge before one of those hits us um, on the head. All right, guys, so a bit more activity. They, they started yawning, they cleaned themselves a little bit for a while, and now they actually practicing some aloe grooming, you know, cleaning one another, just reassuring the social bond between each other, also getting into all those spots where they can't get by themselves. Um, but this typically is a sign of them starting to get active and will be up soon. <coughs> so hopefully we'll get, get them moving around a little bit just before we have to say goodnight. But, you know, sometimes they enjoy grooming one another so much that they can do this for up to oh, half an hour. But just to see them a little bit more active and to see that bond between the two brothers are actually quite cool. <coughs> you know, for them it is an absolute necessity to have a very strong bond between one another to be able to, you know, protect or defend territories and do all of those things. Um, of course, there's going to be some tension when it comes to mating with females and also things like kills. When it's a smaller kill, they'll definitely have some tension between one another because both of them want the good stuff, but the stronger one will definitely pull rank when it comes to that. So there might here and there be a little bit of a fight going and so on. So always important to whenever they're not fighting spend a little bit of time reassuring themselves or the and the other one that they still love each other. You can see they're paying a lot more attention now to towards the water holder, which is where the wind is coming from. So possibly smelling something. And there we go. Cheryl, yes, they will. Um, as long as both of them live, they'll stay together. It's highly unlikely. Um, however, not impossible, but highly unlikely that a coalition like this, especially when they're related to one another, coming from the same litter specifically, 
um, will break up. Uh, it just makes much more sense for them to be together. You know, um, hunting will be easier, keeping their territory will be easier, you know, as you can imagine, if there's a, a young male now, an aspiring young male that wants to take over, let's say, their territory, which is a very good territory to have. Lots of females, lots of game. So lots of opportunity not only to hunt, but also to recre uh, you know, reproduce. Um, they'll be able to chase them off rather easily, whereas if it's one-on-one, -on -one, when you get a little older, those chances start becoming slimmer and slimmer of, of keeping your territory. So there we go. Hello, boys. Um, they will absolutely stay together as long as they can and most likely that will mean that as long as they both live so definitely makes much more sense for them to be together guys okay, so we're gonna follow them a little bit see maybe maybe we get lucky and in these last couple of minutes they give us some action even if they're just moving like they are right now that will also be cool but we've been waiting for this the whole afternoon so hopefully soon cat rain um yes large cat that i know of the cheetah is the only cat with semi-retractable claws but doesn't retract it completely um, all of the large cats that we have in africa is able to retract their claws like the lion and the leopard and you know even if you go a little smaller things like the caracal and the serval and so on they all have fully retractable claws <coughs> um, jaguars those types of things when you go outside of of africa um, jaguars and tigers and so on they can also fully retract their claws so yes uh, the cheetahs are the only ones that i know of with semi-retractable claws, but you'll always find a little bit of claw sticking out just to have that running spike effect. You know, when they're running at those great speeds, the fastest that I've heard a cheetah being recorded, it's 124 kilometers an hour. That's just what I've heard. But typically, I mean, it's well known that they can clock about 100 kilometers an hour um, when hunting or when they need to. However, over here, you'll find them typically hunting at around 80 kilometers an hour, but I mean, even still then, you'll want that extra little bit of traction on your, on your paws um, to when they have to turn quickly, when a springbok does a quick turn to the right or to the left, um, just have that extra little bit of grip for when they need to uh, turn so agilely. Um, the tail obviously will help for that as well. That's like a big balancing beam that they swing around while they turn when they're running at those great speeds. Um, but it will absolutely be a great benefit for them to have those claws out. Whereas with something like a lion or a leopard or so, it makes much more sense for them to have fully retractable claws so that they can use their soft pads to stalk as close to as they can to the prey species and then be able to launch an attack from let's say 20 meters or 10 meters away with the leopards i've sometimes seen them only starting the charge at around five meters away from the prey species so with cheetahs that typically is not the case you'll find them charging from much further away um, so they utilize their speed more than stealth. Yeah, it seems like they're definitely looking for something to hunt. But yeah, guys, unfortunately, <laughs> it has come to that time of the afternoon, whereas if they don't hunt and kill in the next 45 seconds, we're gonna have to maybe come back tomorrow morning and have a look to see if they did or whether they were successful. It is lovely to have had you all on the show with us, seeing all of the different animals, all the elephants and the leopards and the lions and all of those things, cheetahs included. Um, 
So we hope to see all of you back here tomorrow morning at 5.30 on channel 183 on DSTV. Or you can also follow us on YouTube. Um, and remember to send us all of your questions using the hashtag Wild Earth and so on. And we'll be able to answer them for you as best as we can. But for the time being, guys, we're going to have to say goodnight and see you tomorrow morning, okay?